Welcome. This video is designed for you to relax or fall asleep to. Because of this, I only put in three ads after the first three stories. No more ads after that. Also, my app, Chilling, now has almost 1,000 stories that have never been on this channel. Now with 16 narrators. Some of them just might be your favorites from YouTube. Oh, and no ads. There are zero ads on Chilling. Click the link in the description to download and try it out. If you think this video is cool, please subscribe and hit the like button for me. It helps me out a lot. Now, let's begin. I have had three sleep paralysis instances in total that I can remember. The first time was in 2018 when I had just moved back to Australia from America and I was on a really uncomfortable inflatable mattress. All I can remember was waking up, only barely being able to move, and really struggling to sit up. As this was happening, my vision in front of me was mostly blacked out, but I could still somewhat see around me. I quickly broke from it and was terrified as I had heard of sleep paralysis before and knew about the horrors people have faced as a result of it. Safe to say I considered myself lucky. The second time was in 2020. I had woken up in the morning and could not move at all, not even slightly. The instance was a lot more severe and terrifying for me, as all I could think about while locked out of my body was, there better not be a shadow. With this, I attempted to yell and scream, but all that came out my mouth were groans. Thankfully, I eventually snapped out of it before the sleep paralysis could escalate further, or my worst fear of seeing a shadow person or apparition came true. That brings us to the third and most traumatizing and terrifying encounter I had with sleep paralysis. It was during 2021 and in the midst of a stressful time for me due to university exams. This may have been something that contributed towards it, but then again, who knows? This time was very different from the previous two. I vividly remember dreaming of being in an unfamiliar house that when describing it to people, I usually connect it to having a very similar appearance to the house from the amazing world of Gumball. I know, weird connection to make, but that was my first thought when thinking over the appearance of the house. I remember in the dream approaching some photos on a wall in some living room space. They were photos of my family. Group photos and individual photos all scattered the walls. I was looking through them until I saw an unfamiliar face. It was a standalone photo of a woman, who appeared to be in her 30s, wearing a white, Victorian, old-style dress, all on her own, staring into my soul. Upon seeing this, I was especially creeped out, so I turned my head to the left and stopped right in my tracks. There she was, the exact same woman from the photo just standing in the living room of this house, facing away from me. In my dream, I let out some sort of loud reaction, and all of a sudden her face snapped sideways, where her eyes were meeting mine, at which point I awoke instantly. However, to my horror, I quickly discovered I was experiencing sleep paralysis yet again. This time, however, I looked slightly to my side to see the woman, yet again, but actually standing on the other side of my room. Words cannot describe the level of pure fear and terror I experienced at that moment. As I began to try and scream and yell, the only noise that came out of my mouth, yet again, was some weird groan, not loud enough for anyone to hear. Things only escalated when the woman began to slowly approach my bed, while slightly kneeling down to meet her face with mine, all while she had a finger over her mouth, smiling at the same time as if to hush me for my desperate attempts at screaming out for help, as well as mocking me for doing so. The terror of this was almost unbearable for me. I remember looking towards the roof of my room and seeing multiple white glowing apparitions moving in and out of my ceiling, all while this woman is constantly saying, Shh. 
Next thing I know, it was all gone. I could finally move again, and I had never been more grateful to fully wake up in my entire life. I don't know if anything from what I experienced had any deeper meaning. I seriously doubt it, too. Since all this, I have never been able to identify the woman with anyone I know, or anyone from my family that I never met, but still have photos of. I hope I never need to give an update with a fourth experience of this horrible phenomenon. The following took place when I was in grade 10, attending high school in Ontario, just under an hour east from Toronto. I am 30 years old now, and I have only mentioned this to a handful of people. It isn't the scariest story ever, but it definitely gave me and my friends at the time the creeps. Let's begin. During lunch hour, I never liked eating in the cafeteria. Too crowded, and I didn't like people watching me eat. I'm not too sure why now, but my friends felt the same way, so we either would go to one of our houses for lunch, or we'd discover some place outside near our school where we could sit, eat lunch, throw a baseball around after, etc. We stumbled upon this creek behind some backyards with a few big rocks that could be used as a makeshift seating area. It was secluded enough that we thought it would be a cool place to eat our lunch and hang out for an hour. FYI, we were not trespassing in anyone's backyards. They were all fenced off, and the creek was accessible to anyone walking by. Including myself, there were four of us. We ate lunch, joked around, and started playing catch with a baseball in the mitts that we brought with us. I stood further into the creek, so near a bunch of tall trees that I think turned into a forest if you keep going. My friend threw the baseball. I missed catching it and it rolled to the base of a tree a few feet behind me. I walked over to retrieve the ball, and sitting upright on the other side of the tree was what I think was a female with long, straight black hair facing the opposite direction, not moving at all whatsoever. I noticed her right before I picked up the ball and my stomach dropped. I knew to play it cool so she wouldn't react and scare me, even more than I already was, so I picked up the ball and speed walked out of there and said to my friends, Guys, let's go, we're going to be late. They were all saying how we had time and that we were going to be early, etc., but I looked at them with my eyes wide open, as if trying to communicate with my eyes, and again I said, Let's go. Confused, my friends followed me out of there, and as we were walking away, I periodically looked behind us to see if we were being followed. When we were at a distance far enough I felt it was safe, I told them what I saw. They all believed me because they knew I wouldn't just randomly make up that to ruin our lunch break, and not to mention how much I hated going back to school early after lunch. Being curious, dumb teenage boys, however, we did return to that creek a few days later, and the person sitting behind the tree was not there. In my 30s, I have never had anything as unsettling as this happen to me before, and I still remember it as if it happened yesterday. Like I said, I have only told this story a handful of times, and it still gives me the chills to this day. Around the age of four, when I was living in Sunrise, Florida, it was known within my family that my aunt's house was haunted. I spent quite a bit of time there as a kid, as she would babysit for me. I always had a good time with her, and have fond memories of being at her house. I was spoiled by my aunts and uncles since I was the first baby. She always got me the best toys, had the best snacks, and I loved hanging out with the kids who lived next door to her the oldest, Luba, and her little sister, Happy. Now that I'm an adult, I understand how strange those names are, but never really occurred to me as a kid. They always seemed to be there when I was there. 
I have vivid memories of all of us all sitting in my little mermaid tent, laughing and playing house. My aunt had two dogs that would just sit there while we brushed their hair with Barbie combs and put bows in their hair. We called it dog makeover. We often did typical kid things. Luba and Happy were such pranksters. Sometimes they would move the dog's food bowls across the kitchen or turn on a toy so it made noises, hide it, and run away just to laugh at my aunt going nuts looking for it. She always seemed confused by the silly pranks, and as kids, that just made us laugh. One time, we were hanging out in the tent while my aunt had been vacuuming the living room. We turned off the vacuum and walked away to do something in another room. We had convinced ourselves that if we turned it on and it stayed in one spot, that it would suck all the way through the other side of the earth. So, Luba ran over to the vacuum, turned it on, and ran back to the tent. We peered out the plastic window of the tent and laughed while my aunt threw up her arms and yelled my name out in frustration. I always remember thinking it was always me who was catching all the blame, but figuring that my aunt just didn't want to yell at the neighbor kids. Over time, Luba and Happy showed up less and less. I thought they were either at school or busy and weren't able to come over as often. After all, we were all getting older and I also was not at my uncle's house as often. After so long of not seeing them, I chalked it up to the fact that they had moved away. Eventually, my aunt had her own kids and raised them in that house until they were around four or five years old before they moved out of state. Life had gone on as it does, and Luba and Happy were just a fond memory that I would often think back on and wonder how they were doing or where they were at in life. Fast forward to 10 years later. I am about 14 or 15 years old. Our family had all lived in different states at this point, so when we would gather around the holidays, we always had catching up to do and walks to take down memory lane. A conversation came up about childhood friends between my mom and aunt, and all the memories of Luba and Happy came flooding back to me. I was thinking to myself, I wonder if my aunt might know where they're at now. So I chimed in and asked her if she remembered Luba and Happy. She contemplated it for a moment. You could see her trying to think about it. She asked me with a very confused look on her face, Luba? Happy? I have never known any kids with such strange names. I went over everything I knew about them. You know, the neighbors by your house in Florida. The ones always messing with you and you would blame me. My mom snapped her fingers and said, Oh, at the haunted house? I was very confused when she said this as I had no knowledge of her house being haunted. My aunt, still looking confused, responded, That house was definitely creepy. I don't remember any kids ever being there other than you and your cousins. You had imaginary friends? I was absolutely certain that these friends were not imaginary. After all, I knew as a kid that other kids often had imaginary friends, and I would wonder how is that even possible to create an image of a whole person in your head. I insisted that they were actually there. I knew they were there. But she seemed very set on the fact that they were not. Her and my mom started to go back and forth. Remember the dog bowls would just slide across the kitchen floor or the toys in the other room turning on at the very bottom of the toy box? I literally just sat there and could not believe what they were saying. I thought for sure they had lost their minds due to old age. Those kids were there. They moved the dog bowl and played all the pranks. I saw it with my own eyes. My aunt told me, There was definitely a lot of creepy things that happened in that house. At first I thought you had been behind all the things turning on and off or moving around because I had to rationalize it. I realized after some time that something weird was going on but decided to ignore it since I don't really believe in that kind of stuff anyways. My jaw was on the floor, folks. I was so creeped out. I was so confused. I had imaginary friends? What? My family was all in agreement about the ghosts in the house, nodding and reassuring each other. 
I finally said out loud. So, I had imaginary friends named Luba and Happy. I need to be in therapy. About this time, my cousin had rounded the corner to the dining room we were all sitting in, and in the giddiest voice said, Luba and Happy, they were my friends. We all kind of looked at her in silence and then looked at each other before someone blurted out, Wait, you saw Luba and Happy too? Without missing a beat and not realizing what the big deal was, my cousin confirmed to us, Of course, they were always at my house and always in my playroom. They used to play pranks on mom. Everyone sat in shock. Nothing made sense. All the kids in my family who had set foot in that house over the years knew Luba and Happy. I don't think the odds are that great of having the same imaginary friends your cousin did years apart. We filled my cousin in on the haunting of the house. She was equally as creeped out, and you could see a little shiver of fear go down her spine right before she said, I always wondered how they could go in and out through the walls of the playroom. I have had four separate encounters with deadly venomous snakes. It's like I attract them or something. My first encounter was when I was a little girl. I lived on a farm and was sent out to collect fresh eggs for breakfast. So I get my egg basket and walk out to the chicken coop. Little did I know there was a deadly predator in the coop I was entering. I picked up the first hen, got her eggs, patted her head, and went to the next box. When I stepped up to the next sitting hen, it felt like someone had hit me in the back of the leg with a baseball bat. I screamed and went to turn around, and that's when I saw the snake slithering off. My granddad came running out to see what was wrong. I told him there was a snake and that it had bitten me. He got a shovel and took care of it. Turns out it was a rather cranky and large western diamondback rattlesnake. I spent several weeks in the hospital, almost died a couple of times, but here I still am. So fast forward several years later, I am probably 9 or 10 years old and sitting with my uncle and brother in a fishing boat, trying to catch something for a fish fry. We were out on a friend of my uncle's property, a big huge pond full of fish. I wasn't really super excited sharing a boat with my brother, so I was a little sullen. I brought my portable walkman to drown out the boys and sat down on the bottom of the boat to get comfy and wait till this all was over. I was jamming to my tunes and must have drifted off. The next thing I know, over the music, I can hear my uncle screaming at me, so I turn the tunes down, look up at my uncle, and he has this look on his face, like I have never seen before. It was pure, unadulterated horror. So I'm sitting here too terrified to move, because I have no idea what has gotten him so upset. And that's when I feel something touch my hair. Just a small little flicker. But I still don't move. My uncle then proceeds to grab his weapon and a boat oar. He's pointing his weapon right over my left shoulder. And that's when I turn ever so slightly to see a black snake head crawling up the boat right beside me. I lost it. I screamed and jumped at the same time my uncle fired. Turns out it was a water moccasin, or a cotton mouth. Fast forward another several years. I'm a teenager now and working alongside my father and his buddy, laying carpet in some old run-down trailers. You know, for side teenager money. It was summertime and hot. We were working on this particular nasty old trailer, trying to get it livable again, which I couldn't see, but whatever. So my dad's friend gave me my tools and carpet and told me to go in and do one of the bedroom closets in what would be the kids' room. It was a rather large walk-in type closet, but I was having trouble seeing anything because of the lack of light. So I go in this closet and go to the far corner and start working on pulling this nasty old carpet out. So I'm pulling and yanking and cussing 
when I hear a sound that sends shivers down my spine. It's the sound of a rattlesnake. I didn't try to move because I wasn't sure where he was. It was dark and I wasn't trying to get bit again. So I go screaming for my dad, which he's a lot of help because he's terrified of snakes too. He walks into the room, hears that sound, and runs out. Luckily, my dad's friend wasn't quite so afraid. He walked outside and got a bucket, used a stick to pick up the snake, and got it back outside where it belonged. Now here's my last snake experience. I'm dating this guy who has a wood-burning fireplace in his house. So one morning, we are out on a friend's property cutting some wood for firewood. Yes, I have been out there with them cutting these trees. We had been out in the woods since the sun came up, working our butts off. It was around lunchtime, and I was about done for the day. So I grabbed my drink and scouted the nicest place to sit and take a break for a bit. There was a nice little break in the trees, and turned into a nice rocky area, with some rather nice and large rocks for me to sit down on. The sun was shining. It was starting to warm up. Just an all-around beautiful Ozark's day so I pick out the flattest rock I could find to rest on. So I sit down to take my rest. I'm sitting on this rock for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, just taking it easy, enjoying the day. And the guy I was with walks up to me, looks down, and then jumps back away from me like three or four feet. I looked at him like he was nuts. He said, enjoying yourself? And I said, yes, I am. It's a beautiful day. He looks at me and says, You do realize that you are sitting right beside the biggest copperhead snake I have ever seen, right? My whole body went cold. I started to sweat. If I move, he's going to bite me. I know it. I looked down ever so slowly, and this snake is literally snuggled up next to my right thigh. I have no clue what I'm going to do. I can't move. And this very large, very venomous snake is content to just sit right here and snuggle with me all day in the sun. I am dying inside at this moment. This stupid situation couldn't get any worse. Except it could. I drank my whole bottle of water, and now I have to go to the bathroom. I'm not going to be able to sit here all day, and I'm freaking out. So my boyfriend and his buddy decide to try and distract the snake so I could make a mad dash away. They tried sticks. They tried rocks. Anything and everything they could. My situation was getting on the urgent level with my bladder, so I told my boyfriend to go and get my jacket out of his truck. I was going to have to do this myself, apparently. When he came back with my jacket, I told him my plan. He's going to drop the jacket on top of the snake, and as soon as he did, I'm going to bolt. Timing had to be precise. As soon as that jacket got within an inch or two of touching that snake, I jumped sideways off that rock and rolled away as far and as fast as I could. And no, I never got my jacket back either. That snuggly snake could have it. So now you've heard my stories. If I ever die suddenly, at least you folks will know how and why. I just want to start by saying that I live in northern Ontario near a very small village that I'll leave the name out of for privacy reasons. My friend and I, both 14 at the time, who I'll call Steph, wanted to hang out once school was out. At some point during summer break, she messaged my mom through her mom's cell, since we both didn't have phones at the time, asking if I wanted to hang out. I thought it would be fun and agreed to meet up with her. She lived a little ways out of town, but we made plans to walk the 20 minutes to get to town and hang out there. I arrive at around 2, and we begin our trek. Most people are always saying how small and innocent their area is, and how nothing happens. But this town is quite the opposite. It's actually a hot spot for trafficking, drugs, drug busts, assault, 
you name it. Regardless, our tiny 14-year-old brains thought since we had never actually witnessed any of that, we should be safe to walk around town by ourselves. Right? Wrong. We were so wrong. And you will soon find out why. We finally reached our destination and found a convenience store where we could buy some candy and sit on the curb. You know, regular kid stuff. Another friend of mine lived in town, and Steph decided it would be a perfect opportunity to show me where he lived. We are weaving our way through the back roads when we get to this really sketchy, run-down street. We pass an auto shop with the garage door wide open, and see a man working on a vehicle. I nod politely, and we continue on our way down the street, passing by all of the seemingly empty houses, because it's the 21st century, and no one goes outside anymore. We come across a house with an old, disheveled-looking man in the yard. He looks to be around 50 or 60, with completely white hair, a very long and equally white beard. We only noticed him because of how odd he was sitting, like he was sitting normally in a lawn chair, but the back of the chair was on the ground, and his legs straight in the air. Just then, he spotted us and called towards us. Can you come help me? in a loud, demanding tone. We stopped and looked at each other, and I moved to go over to him, when Steph put an arm in front of me. I look at her and say, I think he fell over. We should help him. And she tells me there's no way at our size we could lift him up. The man starts screaming at us to get over there, and it no longer sounds like he wants help. My heart starts racing, and I look around frantically because I want to help him, but my gut feeling says this situation is very off. Why can't he just roll over onto the grass and get up? There's no wheelchair or walking stick in sight, so I'm doubting he's paralyzed. He's continuing to scream at us, saying, Get over here now! I suddenly remember the man in the garage, just a few meters down the street, and I tell Steph if he really needs help, we should go get that man. She agrees, and we tell the old man that we're getting help and we'll be back in a minute. We race down the street as fast as we can, and stumble into the garage huffing painfully and trying to get out the words. There's a man down the street. He might be hurt. It looks like he fell. Without question, the man in the shop follows us to the property. We halt in front of the house, confused and he looks at us with question on his face. The yard is empty, the chair is gone, and the old man is nowhere in sight. We were gone for not even a minute. Even if he did get help in that time, they wouldn't have had time to disappear so quickly. We told the mechanic guy that he was just here, screaming at us to help him. He explains that maybe the guy got up himself and just walked inside, and though I doubted that theory, I nodded my head in agreement. He later gave us some water bottles, and we thanked him and went on our way. I still think about it to this day, and every time I just become extremely perplexed with the whole situation. Where did he go? I still live near that town seven years later, and I go to town at least three times a week, yet I have never once seen him. Maybe he really did just get up himself, but the tone in his voice is what put me off. And why would someone happen to have a lawn chair directly in the center of their yard facing their house? It makes no sense, but nonetheless, I hope I never see him again. Ever since I was little, and despite occasional insomnia, I have always been a deep sleeper and difficult to rouse. This has also been accompanied by my vivid dreams. I have never been able to harness the ability to lucid dream, as when I realize it is one, I become too excited and inevitably wake up completely, or just enough that I am not experiencing the dream, but watching it as if it is a movie. That being said, I have never truly tried to learn how to lucid dream. 
This is because I heard lucid dreaming can cause sleep paralysis, and to me, my dreams are enough of an adventure as it is, and the terrors that come from sleep paralysis are just not worth it to me. I already suffer from night terrors and anxiety dreams, so the idea of having one of those while mostly awake and aware of my surroundings sounds like, well, you guessed it, a nightmare. Occasionally, when I'm drifting off to sleep, especially during naps, my body will be asleep, but my mind is partially aware and awake. This allows me to perceive the sounds around me or even conversations people are having. While unrelated, this is also when I am the most active with my sleep talking if you engage me directly. On the even rarer occasion, I can be having a dream and narrate to people around me what I am seeing. So, I live with my husband and ever since my work schedule changed a few years ago, I have struggled to wake up earlier than 9 or 10 a.m. Occasionally when my husband leaves for work, I'll get up and let the dogs out to pee, let them back in, and go back to bed. In my sleepy haze, I sometimes forget to lock the door before going back to bed. If I'm not sure if I have or not, I'll usually get back up and go check. Other times, I'll be so exhausted that I've already drifted off to sleep. From time to time, my husband will be sent home early so he can come back during the night shift and help out. Sometimes he comes home an hour after he started his shift. Since I have become so used to the sound of his heavy boots walking on our wooden floors, this usually doesn't rouse me from my sleep, and if I am in a deep, exhausted sleep, I won't wake at all. If it does startle me, the most that happens is I am pulled into that semi-aware state of mind. I'll feel him get back into bed with me, and all is well. Now, mind you, we live in the middle of nowhere, and we never get any visitors, but I still have this fear that someone is going to try to break in during the day while my husband is at work. I have two guard dogs, but one of them is now deaf, and at the time of this story, the other one was a young puppy who wouldn't bark if something in the house frightened him. He would instead grow silent and still. Now, on to what happened a few months ago. It was our typical morning. My husband got up out of bed, taking a shower and getting dressed before kissing me goodbye and heading to work. A few hours had passed. I was fading in and out of sleep, so I was partially aware that sunlight had begun to creep into the room. Not too long after I passed back out, I heard a noise that roused me from my dreamless sleep. I heard my husband's heavy footsteps calmly walking around the front of the house. Neither of our dogs made a move or a sound, and the noise level was low enough that it hadn't caused me to fully wake up either. I sat there, patiently waiting for him to make his way back to our bedroom so that we could cuddle up and go back to sleep, when a horrible thought occurred to me. What if it isn't my husband? Had he forgotten to lock the door when he left? What if this is that intruder I've been worrying about? What if I can't wake up before they realize someone else is in the house? This is when I start to hear the heavy boots making their way down the hallway, towards our bedroom. At this point, I think my eyes are open. I can see our bedroom, and I'm watching the door to the hallway, anxiously awaiting to see my husband round the corner to our room. This is when I start to realize these boots don't sound like my husband's, and the terror sets in. I have this horrible sense of impending doom. There's a strange, large man in my house. My dogs are unaware or defenseless, and I am too out of it to get up and defend myself. As the steps reach the doorway, I shut my eyes tight, praying the man will think I am asleep and try to sneak out without being caught. I hear the footsteps pause in the doorway, and I can feel this evil presence flood the room. I suddenly realize he's here. For me. The heavy boots slowly make their way over to my side of the bed, and I can feel my weight being pressed down as he leans over me as if to whisper in my ear. I know now that I do not want to know what he is about to tell me. 
I need to do everything I can to not hear what he is about to tell me. So I did the only thing I could. I strained my ears and caused my eardrums to tremble, causing a deep, rumbling sound in my ears. I feel the lightest sensation of his breath on my ear and jawbone as I continue straining that little muscle. He stands back up and exits the room, and I am released from my sleep. I jump out of bed and grab the nearest weapon we have and comb through the house. As you may have guessed, there was nobody there. The front door was locked. Our dogs were undisturbed, but my heart was pounding in my chest. I was drenched in sweat, and the fear had me trembling. I placed the weapon back where it belonged and messaged my husband about what had happened and I later told my sister-in-law about it. My sister-in-law has had a few run-ins with these beings and has done some research on her own. While she didn't share with me what she knew, she said, It's a really good thing that you didn't let it put things in your head. Her comments made the whole experience that much creepier. What would have happened if I had listened to what it had said? What could it have told me that would have been so devastating to change my life in the worst way possible? Was it going to tell me something? Or was it going to command me to do something that I inevitably would be unable to resist? A part of me wishes I knew. But I am very glad that I don't. This will be the first time that I'm sharing my story. I have never told anyone about this before because I'm scared of the way people will react. But here we go. This event happened back in 2016 when I was 26. Me and my best friend, I'll call him Tanner, were out drinking at your typical Irish pub. Tanner was there with his girlfriend, who I've also been friends with for a few years. I'll call her Sarah. Me and Tanner started drinking early, and Sarah got there later, around 9 p.m. I remember Sarah being mad at me for letting Tanner get as drunk as he was. Sarah chilled out after I ordered a few rounds of tequila for us, and we resumed having a good time, laughing about all of the funny times that we have had together. Me and Tanner originally went to the pub to watch a live band that we have seen a bunch of times perform, but for some reason, they never ended up showing up so we just continued to drink beer after beer and shot after shot. I admit I was really drunk, but I can say for a fact, drinking alcohol had nothing to do with whatever was about to happen to me. Tanner and Sarah started arguing about something. I can't remember what it was, but it was probably something stupid, because those two were always getting mad at each other over nothing. Tanner ended up saying something like, Fine, we'll just go home right now then. And I remember feeling bummed out that my best friend was going to leave when we were having such a good time. I convinced them to stay for one more shot on me. I told the barmaid to bring another round to the table. Tanner and Sarah asked for their bills, and I got up to go to the bathroom. When I was taking a leak at the urinal, I felt kind of dizzy for a second and thought I might have to throw up. I thought to myself, Maybe it was a mistake ordering another shot. As I was walking out of the bathroom, I saw Tanner and Sarah looking at me already holding their shot glasses in the air, saying, Come on, come on. Tanner handed me my shot. We banged the glasses together and said cheers. Tanner and Sarah got up. I gave them both a hug and we said our goodbyes. I asked, How are you guys getting home? Tanner said he was just going to drive. I said just get a cab. You don't want to get pulled over or crash your new car. He argued with me saying it was only a five minute drive and it wasn't worth leaving his car at the pub to take a cab. I told him again that I thought it was a bad idea, but he kept saying it would be fine. So I gave up trying to get through to him. He said he would text me when they got home and I said something like, Okay, I'll be waiting for it. Waving my phone at him. After around 30 minutes, 
I still had not received a text. But to be honest, I kind of forgot about it as I was mingling with other people at the pub. That's when I felt my phone vibrate. It was Sarah calling me. I answered her call and was about to say something like, Took you guys long enough. But before I could say anything, she was yelling into the phone, crying, saying something I couldn't make out. I said, Calm calm down, what's going on? She said they got into an accident. She was crying so much I could barely make out what she was saying. I kept asking questions like, Oh, how bad is it? Is Tanner hurt? Are the police there? Then she started hysterically saying over and over, He's not waking up. I think he's dead. Then she said that she saw the police cars coming and hung up on me. My heart sank to my stomach. I tried to call her back probably ten times, but no answer. I didn't know how to react as I was in pure shock and felt like I was going to throw up. I ran to the bathroom and threw up into the sink. I was looking at myself in the mirror, and all I could feel was anger. I started punching the walls of the bathroom and screaming. I sat on the ground by the sink and thought about how it was all my fault. If only I would have taken his keys. If maybe I didn't ask him to hang out that night, this all could have been avoided. I picked myself up and wiped the tears out of my eyes. I didn't want to be here anymore. People were looking at me, laughing. I just wanted to pay my tab and leave. When I left the bathroom, I came around the corner to where my table was, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I saw Tanner and Sarah holding their shot glasses, saying, Come on, come on, hurry up. I froze. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know if this was even real. Tanner said something like, You don't look too good. I grabbed him and started saying a bunch of jumbled nonsense trying to explain what just happened. He then laughingly said something like, Maybe you don't need another one of these. I let out the biggest sigh of relief and teared up again. I was so confused but also so relieved. It was the same feeling you get when you awake from a terrible nightmare and realize you're safe in your own bed. I sat there speechless for a second. Tanner and Sarah took their shots, and then Tanner grabbed his keys. I said, Tanner, wait, how are you getting home? He said he was just going to drive, as they lived only five minutes away. I started to freak out. I felt the whole event I had just witnessed was happening again. I yelled, No, give me your keys. I'm paying for your cab home. He was saying something like, What's your deal? It's all good. I said, no, trust me, it's not a good idea. I pulled cash out of my wallet and said, here, take it. I also said that I would drive him back to the pub in the morning to get his car. He said, all right, thanks, man. And that is probably for the best. I remember watching them leave, feeling so confused as to what was going on. I yelled across the bar, message me when you get home waving my phone in the air. Sarah waved goodbye and Tanner just smiled as they walked out the door. I sat at my table with my head in my hands for about ten minutes, then felt a buzz from my phone. It was Tanner. He said thanks for the cab, I'm home, and that he was worried about how hungover he was going to be in the morning. I could feel an intense weight being lifted off my chest, and I finally called my own cab home. For the next few days, everything felt weird to me. I didn't know what to think of this thing that happened. I didn't know if I should go see a psychiatrist or talk to my friends and family about it. I decided to keep it to myself because I have always been scared of what people would think of me after telling them this insane story. I have been thinking about this almost every day for the past few years. It brings me closure to finally share my story even if it's anonymously. I feel like for some reason something gave me another chance to save my friend. I don't know what this is or why it happened. I just pray something like this never happens again.
I have thought about this event at least once a day, and even though it's been a few years and some details are fuzzy, it still gives me the chills. A group of us were sitting around chilling one January night when one of us thought it would be fun to have a bonfire using the brown and dried out Christmas tree as the kindling. We were bored, so we all jumped at the chance of doing something, even if it was potentially illegal. Another of my friends made the comment, it's only illegal if we get caught. And with that logic, we set out to find a location to bid the Christmas season goodbye. My friend, who we'll call Sheila, knew of a place we could head to and would likely not get caught by any police interference. The only stipulation was that we had to wait for the cover of nightfall. What she failed to mention was that this area was a swamp with wooden walking paths weaving through the trees and water for patrons during the day. Driving up and not seeing any lights, this didn't look like a place that would be open during the night. Yet, here we are. Once we arrived and had set up our tree to be burned, another of our friends thought it would be fun to walk the darkened trails. No flashlights, just the small amount of moonlight that we had. We all looked into the forest, uneasy, but agreed to the adventure. Using the headlights of our cars, we saw two entrances leading into the forest. Naturally, we thought we would enter in one side and come out the other. Making our way towards the part, Sheila and I hung back so we could conspire to pull a prank. There was one guy in our group who she had a crush on, and the two would often flirt and banter with one another, and she learned that he was quite the scaredy cat. The prank was for me to slink off towards the exit to the path, meet them halfway, and jump out and scare the wits out of him. Of course, this was too good of a chance to pass up, so as they headed down through the entrance of the path, I snuck off going through the exit. The swamp was alive with the sound of toads croaking, insects buzzing, creatures chattering and scurrying, and a couple of times I heard the splash of water as a toad plopped into the water as I had gotten near. The blackness of the night didn't bother me, as I was much too excited about scaring the crap out of Sheila's crush. The look on his face, the squeals of his screaming, it was going to be awesome. Eventually. I kept walking and walking, but wasn't finding the group. Surely they should have met them by now. But where are they? I stopped for a moment, straining my ears to see if I could hear them coming towards me. But all I was met with were the sound of the swamp, and then silence. I stopped. Was it possible that they were quiet so they could scare me? Sure, but all of them being that quiet? Do you know the sound someone makes when they're swimming slowly through the water? A sort of light sloshing noise? That was the sound I was hearing coming from in front of me. I froze, straining my ears towards the sloshing, noticing that it didn't sound like a frog or a fish, but what it sounded like, I had no idea. There was a thud against the wooden path, rocking it slightly, then slapping noises that sounded like wet flippers hitting the ground. I would be curious afterwards, but with my heart hammering in my chest and my knees about to give out from underneath me, I turned around and took off as fast as I was able out of the swamp and away from whatever it was that was back there. When I emerged from the forest, my group of friends were out there waiting for me, Apparently, after not seeing me for a while, they grew concerned. So concerned that Sheila had given away the prank about to be pulled, and they hurried back, not knowing what had become of me. They were about to walk the path I had taken to find me, when I suddenly appeared. It wasn't until later that we discovered that the two paths that we had seen led in two different directions, something that would have been nice to know beforehand. As for what was in that swamp, I have no idea, and none of my friends believed me, thinking that it was just a frog or something. Over the years, I tend to think that maybe they were right, and I just imagined it. But that didn't remove the fact that this was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life.
This happened when I was 15 years old. It was about five years ago, and I was living at home. It was just me and my mom, and we lived in a small apartment in a medium-sized city, and my mom was always working and never home. So there was not much adult supervision at home, and I would spend most of my nights on Facebook. So one night, I was settling in for another dinner of mac and cheese and watching YouTube, when my phone buzzed. I didn't have many friends at the time, and the only person who really messaged me was my mom, but she was at work, so I knew it would not be her. I paused my YouTube video and put down my mac and cheese and picked up the phone. I looked at my phone and saw that I had a Facebook message. I clicked on it to read it, and I did not recognize the person sending it. All it said was, Hi, Amy. I didn't think anything of it, and I was in the middle of my dinner, so I just put my phone back down. Another couple minutes later, I heard my phone vibrate again. It was from the same person, and this time it said, How are you doing, Amy? This time I replied and said, I'm fine, who is this? There was no response, so I finished eating my dinner and watched a few more videos and went to bed. The next night was pretty much the same routine, and I was home by myself eating dinner and watching YouTube. I got a message on Facebook, and this time it said, Are you enjoying your macaroni and cheese? This time I was caught off guard and was starting to get upset. I answered back, Who is this? Almost instantly another message came in that said, I'm watching you and I know you're alone. Now I was getting scared, but in the back of my mind I was thinking it could have been one of my friends playing a joke on me. They knew that I ate mac and cheese almost every night for dinner, so it could have just been somebody guessing, and it was just a coincidence that I was eating mac and cheese again. It didn't help that this was late fall, so it got dark very early, and being home alone was already a little unsettling to begin with. My mom had warned me to be careful online ever since I started using Facebook about a year earlier. She had told me about how people could get catfished or how your identity could get stolen. I had not had any bad experiences online up to this point, so I figured she was just being an overprotective parent. I'm watching you, and I'll be watching you when you go to sleep tonight. Was the next message I read. I turned off my phone and finished my nightly routine and went to bed, but not before I blocked that person from my account. I got up early the next day, and I could hardly keep my eyes open from not getting very much sleep. I walked to my high school, which was about a 20-minute walk from my apartment. Everything went fine at school. It was a normal, usual day at school, but I struggled to get through it because of how tired I was. But I dragged along the day the best I could. After school, I stopped at a fast food place for about a half an hour before walking the rest of the way home. While I was walking home, I thought I noticed the same car drive past about four or five times. It was already getting dark, so I wasn't sure if it was the same car. When I was just getting to the parking lot of my apartment complex, a car drove by, and someone yelled out the window, Enjoy your mac and cheese, Amy. When I turned to look, the car was turning at the corner, and all I could see were the brake lights and no description of it. I could only think of one person who would want to mess with me. I had broken up with my boyfriend a month earlier, and he lived in a town about 45 minutes away. It was a really bad breakup because I had caught him cheating, but he swore it was a mistake, and he only wanted to be with me. I didn't take him back, and all of his friends told me he was not over it. I can only guess that it was him stalking me on Facebook and in the car. I ended up deleting my Facebook for almost a year, and I never noticed any more cars following me. I want to start this story off by saying that for the sake of confidentiality, all real names will be replaced with fake ones. 
Me and my friends had a phase when we were around 18 years old where we were fascinated with the idea of exploring abandoned locations, usually disregarding how dangerous or risky the area is. Since I live in one of the more suburban and unpopular areas of Australia, oftentimes it would be difficult to find new and exciting places to investigate. So you can imagine when we caught wind of an abandoned apartment complex in the city, we immediately jumped on the idea of paying the place a visit. We decided to go on the same night we planned on visiting a club, so by the time we arrived at the place, me and my friends were mostly buzzed or intoxicated. Looking back on that, it was a really dumb idea, but we were dumb new adults. This would be a good time to introduce my friends. We have Don, a well-built guy who was the leader of most of our expeditions. Connor, who like myself loved exploring and usually followed what Don would say. And then we have Beth, Kate, Jill, and Brooke, who only really came for the club, but still decided to tag along for the ride. Upon arrival, we were met with a large fence surrounding the perimeter. It was at this point where Kate volunteered to be on lookout for security from the outside, since this place did still seem to be decently monitored. With some struggle, the rest of us managed to hop the fence and we were greeted with the large U-shaped building, standing at around 20 stories tall. As per usual, Don took the lead and fearlessly opened the door to one of the stairwells, myself and Connor following eagerly behind, with the girls hesitantly close behind us. Throughout most of our exploration, we would open doors and look through the rooms. Most of the time we would find many plates and other objects left by previous owners on the stained rugged floors or broken kitchen tops. As we began traversing further up the complex we discovered the stairways were weirdly blocked off, so we would have to constantly move between stairwells in order to get to higher floors. As we were on roughly the 15th floor, I began to get bored from the repetitiveness of the similarity of the rooms, so while in a somewhat drunken state, I thought it would be a good idea to randomly try and kick in one of the sliding glass doors. I know, in hindsight this was a really dumb idea, but you don't exactly consider the consequences in the state and mindset that I was in. Either way, my pathetic attempt at this kick failed, and I was promptly scalded by the others for the noise it made. In the middle of laughing it off, I noticed Jill's face go pale before she began hushing us while pointing upwards. Did any of you hear that noise? I think there's someone above us, she quietly exclaimed. This was enough to set both Beth and Brooke off, wanting to leave immediately. Dawn, however, had a different idea. Then let's go, hurry, he said while brushing past us to the door. Dawn has always been like this, disregarding safety before exploration. We didn't even have time to say no. However, we all had to follow him as we all didn't want him to possibly get hurt, or for us five to be left alone without Don to guide us. Reluctantly, we all quietly chased after Don, who by this point began peeking through the doors and windows to each room on the floor above. We were about halfway through the hallway when we saw security flashlights on the bottom floor, along with Kate's message alerting what we were seeing. Crap. The sound of the kick must have been too loud, and now the bottom level is on high alert. Simultaneously as this is happening, we hear a large thud in one of the rooms right next to where we are standing. Don froze. I guess he must have initially thought that Jill was joking and tried to play it off as such to freak out the rest of us. Yet I had never seen him so reluctant on an exploration before. We all heard it this time. As we approached the door, we continued to hear slight shuffling from the room. This was enough to send Jill, Beth, and Brooke to the other end of the walkway, begging us to leave. But myself, Don, and Connor all knew that for the sake of conclusions, we all needed to see what was behind that door. Don began to approach the door, turned the knob, and pushed the door wide open. I then used my phone to illuminate the room. What we saw next is permanently ingrained in my mind. We saw an older looking man, gray beard with minimal hair, 
cuts all along his right arm, holding a reflective object, resembling a shard of glass or a knife, with the most crooked and twisted smile on his face. The crimson red liquid was splattered all over the carpet, and next thing I know, Don and Connor have already begun fleeing the scene. I too followed closely after them. It was hard to tell if he was chasing us, but assuming the worst, we nearly fell down the flight of stairs desperately trying to get away. Once exiting through the first floor, we were quickly detained by the security staff. Clearly seeing the distress on each of our faces as we tried to communicate the situation we had just witnessed. Long story short, the cops were called to investigate the building and find the man. And roughly half an hour later, they came out with the man in cuffs. He looked filthy and evil as he gave us one last grin before entering the police car. One cop who had been up there told us that it was a good thing we got away from there as his intentions were very clearly awful. Safe to say that we didn't go to any more clubs that night. The next morning I woke up and checked my phone to be introduced with a flood of messages on our group chat. I scrolled up to the beginning to see that Connor had sent a news article published this morning, stating that a homeless man had been murdered and his body was discovered within the apartment complex that night. This sent chills down my spine as I recalled that image of him, and the amount of blood pooled on the ground and down his arm, and worst of all, that insane, crooked smile. Since this event two years ago, none of us have been exploring abandoned places, and in all honesty, I think it's going to stay that way for a really, really long time. I live with my mom and dad here in Escambia County here in Florida. One evening, me and my mom are just sitting around watching TV when we hear some shouting coming from the street outside. At first, my mom just shakes her head and makes some comment about the neighbors being noisy again, and we just carry on watching the show. But as this shouting gets louder and we start to hear this revving engine sound, she turns down the TV a little and we start to listen in to what it was. It sounded like the shouting was coming from right outside our house by that point, so I got up to take a peek around the TV room curtains to see what it was. In the street outside is a kid in his underwear who's just facing down a truck. He's shouting at the driver, who is shouting back, and from what I could make out, the argument is over the truck driver wanting the kid to do something and the kid refusing. I could tell from the way that the kid was addressing the driver that it was some kind of family argument. A gut feeling that was confirmed when the kid eventually called the driver, Dad, at one point. The argument peaks in intensity at one point, and the two people are just screaming at each other with the driver kind of leaning out of the driver's side window, when all of a sudden the driver leans in, revs the truck engine, and legit tries to run the kid over in the middle of the street. Luckily, the kid reacted just in time, dodging the truck and running into one of our neighbor's front yards as it sped past him. My mom, who was also watching by that point, gasps and says, Oh my gosh. And we watch as the truck does a U-turn in the street, preparing to make another pass on the kid. But the kid isn't about to let that happen and runs across some yards in the direction of our house, banging on the front door and screaming for help. We just reacted, running to the front door and letting the kid inside as the truck screamed past again, the driver shouting out the window as it came to a stop. We slammed the door closed and my mom runs to call the cops as I try to comfort the kid, even though he's basically in his underwear and I am in no mood to be hugging a half-naked teenager, no matter how panicked he is. The kid's dad starts banging on our front door now, shouting about how he knew his son was in there and for him to come out so that he could face the music or whatever. Trying to ignore all the commotion, I remember asking what had happened to cause such an intense family argument, and you will seriously not believe what the kid said next. He tells me straight up, basically, no matter how much his dad wants him to, 
he will not take a bath. Ranting about how he's a grown-up and he can do what he wants, and he won't just do what people tell him to do. How he's perfectly capable of looking after himself, and he doesn't need anyone to be keeping tabs on his personal hygiene. It's only then that I start to notice just how bad this kid smells. How his breath smelled awful, and his skin was greasy looking. He obviously hadn't bathed in quite a while, and although there's obviously no excuses for trying to run someone over for something like that, I started to understand why his dad had gotten so frustrated. Now this whole time, the dad is banging on the door, saying he's not going to leave until his son comes out, but my mom had come back to tell us that the cops were on their way, and that everything was going to be okay. But as she's talking to the kid, she had pretty much the same reaction as me, and there's a moment where she stops talking for a second, and her nostrils flare from where she started to get an idea of how bad the kid smelled. And again, with the same air of indignation, the kid tells my mom that no one is going to be the one to tell him to take a bath. How he's a grown man, he wasn't, and how he can make his own decisions. My mom's face when he was telling her this was just a picture, like me. She could literally not believe what she was hearing, nor could she believe the kind of situation that we had gotten ourselves involved with. Eventually, the cops showed up and tried to talk to the dad as he was screaming profanities at our front door. We watch from the window as he gets into a seriously heated argument with them, to the point that they wrestle him to the ground before they detained him. This gave an opportunity to talk to the cops ourselves, and as crazy as the whole situation was, we had to tell them the truth of the matter, that the dad had actually tried to run his kid over, which was basically attempted murder. Naturally, the cops agreed, and they arrested the guy but not before asking him if he had in fact tried to run his kid over. The guy responded, He's my son. My son. I'll raise him how I want. If he doesn't do what I tell him, I'ma whip him. Basically confirming that he had tried to hit him with his truck. He was slurring his words the whole time, and it hit me at one point that the guy was pretty drunk from the way he was shouting and slurring at the cops. Definitely not a wise move on his part. That was all the cops needed, apparently, so they put him in the back of their patrol car and took him to jail. That was most definitely one of the craziest things that's ever happened to me, and I suppose it doesn't help the whole Florida man thing that a guy might try to run over his kid for not taking a bath. I suppose, given the behavior of his kid, that this might be more like a Florida men story, or like a Florida family story, but I promise... Not everyone here is totally crazy, no matter how much the media makes it out that we're all just nuts. But saying that, since I moved out of state for college, it's definitely something that I've noticed about living further up the East Coast. Sure, there's crazy people everywhere, but the concentration of crazies in Florida is definitely higher than most other places. I'm just glad the situation that night got resolved, and as weird as it was, the outcome was considerably more preferable to just watching a half-naked kid get murdered by his own father. I would much rather just smell some body odor than watch someone die. That's for certain. On Thanksgiving weekend of 1950, a brutally frigid nor'easter storm was battering the coast of Massachusetts and was particularly harsh on the small town of Marblehead, near Salem. Beryl Atherton, a 47-year-old elementary school teacher who had 25 years of service under her belt, was home alone with her dog, Esky, a white spitz who was her constant companion. Since the death of her father, Esky was about the only company she ever kept and Atherton was a self-described spinster with no close friends or family. It is said that her favorite pastimes was watching old movies, and she would drive to the movie theater in Lynn to catch a show, but always went alone. With the freezing winds lashing at her drab, clapboard cottage on Sewell Street, 
Beryl ran a few final errands before her small town was due to be snowed under. She made a run to the grocery store to pick up vital supplies, including a few extra cans of dog food for Eski, before she took a few bags of garbage out to the trash cans outside her home at around 6 p.m. that Saturday evening. When she did so, she spotted a young neighbor boy watching her from a window of his home. She gave the boy a wave, and this was the last time she was seen for a good few days. As predicted, Marblehead was completely snowed under through the course of Thanksgiving weekend, and it took until Monday, November 27th, for the town to dig itself out and resume normal activities. The town's milkman, known among the locals simply as Pint, called on Miss Atherton's home to deliver her milk. Usually speaking, Pint would just leave a person's milk delivery on their doorstep, but he knew that Miss Atherton was extremely thin and frail at barely 100 pounds and was concerned about her well-being after such a vicious snowstorm. So on this occasion, he actually knocked on Miss Atherton's door to ensure she was okay. He knocked once, but there was no answer. Then again, but there was still no answer. On a hunch, Pint tried the door handle and found that it was unlocked. He wandered slowly through Miss Atherton's home at first, calling her name, then walked into the kitchen, finding a scene that would take his breath away. Miss Atherton was lying on the floor, face up, in a pool of her own clotted blood, with Eski lying near her body, mewling in a considerable amount of pain. Pint screamed as he fled the house, careening to the home of one of Miss Atherton's neighbors and pleading with them to call the police. When the police arrived, they deducted that Beryl Atherton had been dead for days. On the kitchen tables were her brown paper grocery bags, still full of food she had brought home on that last day she had been seen alive by the curious neighbor boy, meaning that it had been only moments after this encounter that her murderer had pounced and within maybe an hour of waving to the small boy, Beryl Atherton was lying in a pool of her own blood. She had several broken ribs and bruising around her throat where she appeared to have been strangled, strangled so hard that there were still fingernail imprints in her cold, dead flesh. Her killer had then used a small blade to slice her throat. Infuriatingly, the crime scene was almost completely devoid of any clue as to the identity of Beryl's murderer. There wasn't a single sign of forced entry anywhere on the property. There were no fingerprints on any surface and no shoe or boot prints on the grounds surrounding the house. And despite questioning Beryl's neighbors, no one but the dog, Eski, had seen the killer in the flesh. If Miss Atherton cried out for help, the severity of the storm would have probably drowned out any urgent pleas on that fateful night. No one in the surrounding neighborhood had heard or seen a thing. Despite the grotesque violence of the scene, there appeared to be few signs of a struggle apart from a broken necklace caused by the impact of the killer's blade, which also had broken during the savage and unprovoked attack. And aside from a few broken fingers that suggested she had tried and failed to defend herself from her attacker, it seemed that he had managed to sneak up on Beryl while she was totally unaware. The crime scene was so lacking in useful evidence that it had been theorized that the killer actually hung around for a little while, ensuring that there were no fingerprints, fibers, or DNA present. And since the murder took place in Beryl's kitchen, the killer may have well had ample access to cleaning supplies in order to ensure the scene was scrubbed of evidence. Both police and friends were surprised by the fact Miss Atherton kept a diary, which yielded information about a handful of male acquaintances. The information therein offered no help in solving the crime. It was discovered she had been deeply disappointed over a broken love affair, but this proved not to enter into the case either. In the aftermath of Beryl's murder, with police unable to come up with any suspects or clear motives for her killing, the small town of Marblehead became rife with rumors and gossip. Some said Beryl was leading some kind of double life, 
and had become embroiled with organized crime down in Boston that had come back to bite her. Others believed it was a jilted lover from a broken love affair that had sought revenge after Beryl had broken the engagement off, or perhaps a relative who learned of a sizable inheritance that either wished to access early or were about to be cut off from. Yet her estate only consisted of about $25,000 and no jewelry or other items appeared to have been stolen from the house. So it seems that financial gain may not have been the motive. But chillingly enough, there are some living in Marblehead today who claim they know full well who killed Beryl, and a handful who assert that the killer is still alive. Given that the killer might well be up to 80 or 90 years old, it's more than likely they may pass away before ever facing any charges for the murder they committed. And so, it seems that the brutal crime committed that Thanksgiving weekend may forever remain unsolved, and that yet another cold and callous murderer will escape justice, free to walk the streets in the knowledge that they committed the worst act a person is capable of, and got away with it. I grew up a military brat in San Diego, California. My dad was in the Marine Corps for 25 years, eventually reaching the rank of gunnery sergeant before he retired in 2011. I am really proud of him and I love him very much, but I won't sugarcoat it. Growing up with a parent in the military wasn't easy. He wasn't at home much, and when he was, he was something of a disciplinarian. I didn't have nearly as much freedom as some of my friends did, but that was as much of a boon as it was a burden, because it kept me on track at school and gave me the means to get into a good college later in life. But without a doubt, the worst part of him being in the Marine Corps was when he had to go to war. Although he wasn't part of an initial invasion force, Dad was deployed to Iraq in June of 2003. I was 11 years old at the time, and it really really sucked having to say goodbye to him. No matter how much he tried to assure us that he would be okay, I was old enough to be acutely aware that it might well have been the last time I ever got to talk to him. The last time I ever got to hug him. The last time I had ever got to see him alive. Needless to say, the next six months were some of the most stressful of my life. Every little news report I saw on the TV gave me the worst anxiety and every time we got news that a serviceman had died over there, I feared the worst. Mom tried to shield me as best as she could, but at the risk of sounding a little full of myself, I was smart, inquisitive, and sensitive, and she could only do so much to keep me from worrying. So in September of 2003, Mom decided to take me to Disneyland for the weekend to take my mind off things. To be honest, it was exactly what I needed. I was huge into Disney movies when I was a kid, and although I had been over to Disneyland a few times before, being so stressed around the house meant seeing it again was like doing so through fresh eyes. I took pictures with as many of the characters as I could, and each ride me and mom went on seemed to alleviate my anxiety and depression a little bit more. The whole first day was going wonderfully well. That was until we got in line to ride the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I'm pretty sure it was about 11.30 by the time we got into the little rail cars for the ride itself. Everything was going smoothly at first. We are speeding along these twists and turns until we hit the little fake desert setup and then up an incline into a dark tunnel. I just remember feeling like this jolting sensation shake the cars, all while we're in the dark. Then this horrible grinding of metal and a thud before people in the cars in front of us started screaming. Everything came to a sudden stop and everyone was all really shaken up from it. But it's then that I heard some of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. This woman starts asking, Mark, 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 wake up, wake up, Mark. We are all mostly in the dark but there's a little bit of light coming from the openings of the tunnel on each side of us, and I remember seeing how some of the cars weren't even on the track anymore, 
and that the cars in front of us were all wet and shiny with some kind of fluid. A fluid that I would only later realize to be someone's blood. In the moments after the rail cars came to a stop, people started clambering out of them and walking down the tunnel as fast as they could, calling out that someone was really, really badly hurt and that we needed help up there as soon as possible. As me and my mom climbed out of the rail car and followed, I could see that the train car thing at the very front of the coaster had derailed and that the rear of the thing had like mounted the car behind it. It was only then that I realized that whoever was in the car behind it would have taken the full force of the thing as we sped up that incline. But there were also people in the cars ahead of us who were trapped by it, stuck in the rail cars and unable to get out because of the way they were positioned in the tunnel. Thankfully, me and my mom weren't trapped, so we could just get out of there. But I think it took like another half an hour before firefighters could get them out so that paramedics could treat them before taking them to the hospital. All the people that could get out were herded by park staff towards the River Bell Terrace, where a medical treatment area had been set up. Like I said, me and mom were mostly okay, just a little shaken up from the whole thing. But there were people with some pretty serious injuries who hadn't been so lucky. And we later found out that a guy who had been in the first car had actually died of his injuries. It's horrendously tragic that someone should lose their life when all they wanted to do was go to Disneyland and have fun on a few roller coasters. And I know it's kind of messed up for me to think of it like this, but we really got lucky that day, as way more people could have died. And honestly, I was surprised when I found out that it was only one person that lost their life that day. At least half the riders on that coaster could have died from the way the train just straight up mounted the cars behind it. Since that day, I have never, ever ridden a roller coaster, and theme parks in general just kind of creep me out. I know they are super fun, and I hope I get past my fear of them one day. But for the time being, I'm more than happy to just avoid them and stay safe, because even the sound of people screaming while having fun on them reminds me of Big Thunder Mountain and the way that poor woman just kept screaming for her husband, or son, or whoever he was, to wake up. So, back when I was living in El Paso, Texas, my mother and I rented out a very small apartment, two room and one bath. It worked out well since it was only her and I. I think I was around eight years old, but my mom had to work graveyard at a truck stop. She trusted me enough to let me stay home alone and gave me the basic instructions like do your dishes and go to bed at a reasonable hour. So one night, she kisses me on the forehead and leaves. I had been watching SpongeBob SquarePants and it was really, really late. I think it was about 11 p.m. at that point. At that point, I hadn't listened to my mom's instructions. I didn't do my dishes, and my bedtime was 9 o'clock. So I decided to go to bed, forgetting to check if the doors were locked. So I go to bed, and instead of sleeping, I read Alice in Wonderland. Not sure how much time passes, but I fall asleep. When I wake up, my book is on the floor, and my nightlight is on. I remember being confused as to why I was awake, so I decided to be brave and check it out. I walk around the apartment, wondering if my mom got home early and accidentally made a noise, and that's when I realize the front door is unlocked. Not too concerned, I walk toward it to lock it, but when I go for it, it's almost as if someone is twisting it the other way. The door won't lock if it's being held like that. I'm trying to lock the door when my ears focus on someone's breath. It's not mine. I freak out and start to push on the door, convinced there's someone out there. My heart drops when I start to hear laughter. You see, this apartment complex is rather calm and peaceful. There's almost no disturbances ever. I shove on the door and I feel the tears well up in my eyes. The laughter turns into unintelligible words, and although I can't make out what they're saying, I know it's a man. 
He had a deep voice, and it sounded really raspy. The tone of his words sounds sharp and angry, so I start audibly crying while saying something along the lines of, I'm calling the cops. The laughter starts again, but the resistance stops. I lock the door as fast as I can and run to my room, locking the door behind me. I end up reaching for my phone and calling my mom. Through tears, I'm telling her what happened, and she's trying to calm me down, telling me that it'll be okay. She's telling me that she's coming home. When I hear it, tapping. It sounds like tapping on my window, and I can hear the laughter again. I'm crying louder at that point, telling my mom, begging her to come home now. This is where the story gets blurry. I remember hiding under a blanket and crying until my mom burst through the door yelling for me. I don't remember when the tapping stopped or when the laughter faded, but I remember my first glimpse of true fear. We called the cops and they said they couldn't do much. We ended up dropping it and my mom called our landlord, begging to move us to a second story apartment. Luckily, we were able to move the next week. Myself, age six or seven, and a 16-year-old neighbor, babysitter, were sleeping in my father's trailer in the living room, which had a bar dividing it from the kitchen and blocking most of the kitchen from view. She was on the couch, me on the floor near our TV, even farther from the kitchen. No one was with us, and the dog was sleeping between her and I on the floor. I woke up for an unknown reason jolting from a dreamless sleep with a racing heart, I noticed it was around 2 a.m. and it was a bright moonlit night, which caused it to look like dusk before the sun comes up. A few seconds passed and I tried to find a clock to see the time, but before I could, I heard a bone chilling laugh, which was on a loop of sorts, but each time it repeated three times, but went for longer and shorter random intervals of extending laughter. It was not a person's voice, it was extremely mechanical in tone, high-pitched, but flat-sounding. It was almost a mechanical and distorted version of my mom's voice, mixed with high-pitched, flat, identical laughing. It was like a broken, post-machine-washed, ruined toy with a damaged voice box. Sometimes it would stop, but start again in repetitive intervals of three, but at differently spaced out times. I could hear it was directly coming from the kitchen before the pitch black hallway in the white plastic kitchen table chair my dad often sat in. I was in such fear and shock that I leapt on top of the girl, Kay, and my knee rammed her body by accident from my lap to avoid seeing in the kitchen. She woke up with a painful, but not angry, sleepily ow, trying to convey that it hurt while trying to soothe and tell me to go back to sleep. I rushed, trying to tell her in a panicked whisper that there's a sound from the kitchen that is not normal. All of a sudden, she went from confused to silent as her face and body went tense and eyes widened. We both heard the next interval of laughter. I asked her, do you hear that? And she said yes, hugging me as I clung hugging her with a buried face avoiding looking in the kitchen. I looked at her hysterically and said, I'm afraid, and she said I know, I am too. Both on the verge of crying, she tried to get up and tell me that she was going to see if any friends were outside, pranking us. I was crying in hushed, loud whispering, telling her not to leave me. I was so attached to her torso and hand that she was having to calmly, rushedly, but nicely pull away. She told me to stay there as she got up and went out the front door. The sound kept persisting. She looked in the kitchen from the living room, but saw nothing. I was severely hived up, covered in huge hot red splotches from anxiety, and I was shaking in fear furiously with a clenched jaw. My eyes shot to her walking back in after going around the trailer and up and down the road. The laughter kept happening, 
but it decreased in intervals until it stopped completely as we held each other on the couch, avoiding the kitchen until it stopped, and we both drifted off. I also need to mention the dog was on the couch, wide-eyed, avoiding looking in the kitchen, shaking as violently as I was. She looked petrified. My dad was told about this the next day in the afternoon and went through the entire living room, the bar, and the kitchen, looking for a toy of any sort which could make the noise. He found nothing. I knew I had no noise-making toys. I liked Barbies and cheap stuffed animals, all of which were at the opposite end of the trailer in my room anyway, with a closed door. There was no explanation, and the girl never babysat me again from her own intense fear of reliving that. This is my second shared encounter. Me, age six or seven, and my friend, who is about nine months older than me, but in the same grade. I was being babysat by my childhood friend's mom. She was babysitting me as a request from my dad, who always found a way to isolate me from my mom. My friend's name for the sake of identity protection will be C. C and I were in the living room on separate sides of a huge sectional, so big that I was against the wall on one side of the living room, and she was on the other side. She was near the hallway leading to the other two rooms and bathrooms, where her mom and older brother both slept and were snoring. C and I started hearing that same distorted, loud, horrific laughing at different intervals, which was coming from behind the tiny island separating the kitchen from the open living room, there was only a few feet behind the tiny island we could not see. Our eyes were as wide as saucers. We were both holding big, cheap stuffed animals for comfort, and we were both cocooned in our blankets with our heads exposed. We both stared at the kitchen, where the island blocked our view. Then, our eyes shot from there to each other in absolute horror. I said, That's the sound I heard. We both stared at each other with huge eyes and whispered about what it could be, stating that we are so scared and we also came to the only agreed action that we could do. Ignore it and keep our eyes closed. We did until we fell asleep. I remember it happened for weeks. Eventually I fell asleep after the sound was experienced one night by us both. I woke up with my back arched like an upside down U dizzy, facing the ceiling, jammed against the floor and wall, my knees and legs bent hard, and my arms bent, strained, with contorted, rigid hands like someone who had a stroke. I was covered in vomit. I had, have always had, and still have no memory of anything that happened. I asked her mom why I was on the floor after unbending my tense, strained body. Her and her mom both said my eyes were open. I was not talking in words. Instead, I screamed randomly, many times, going in and out of puking, blood-curdling screaming, to frantic, wordless, senseless babbling. And I went in and out saying that I was going to puke, that there was something wrong, and help me. They were both in disbelief that I didn't remember anything, and C was really upset because I got vomit on her stuffed elephant. She was scared to go near me for weeks. She could not describe what happened to me very well, but I saw the fear and confusion in her eyes from the experience. I remember the sound that haunted me was never experienced by me or my childhood friend together or separately again. In my older age, I still have no hereditary family history of mental illness in either side of my family. Also, me personally having no mental illness, only trauma related to PTSD, depression, and anxiety. After studying a lot in psychology, mental illness, other various mental and physical illnesses, and tons of research, I know that two separate people cannot simultaneously experience the exact same auditory or visual hallucination together.
Back in 2015, I was lucky enough to win a two-day yacht tour that was being raffled off by a local boat rental shop. This was a short cruise with meals provided and a captain to charter us around. I never win anything, so when I entered the contest, I really didn't think I had any chance of winning. I was imagining thousands of entries, and only two entries were chosen. I was actually shocked when I was notified I won. Two people were chosen, and you could bring a guest over the age of 21. I, of course, brought my partner, and the other person who won brought his wife. The other couple, Robert and Carol, were funny, outgoing, older folks. Definitely not the worst company to have for almost two days. We met with the captain, his first mate, and the owner of the store on the dock at 2 p.m., and were due to set sail at 3.30. We went over a few safety courses, took a tour of the boat, and they showed us our very tiny rooms. I don't know why I was envisioning the kind of yacht that Jeff Bezos has. It was very much not that. The yacht was nice enough, a little older and smaller, but definitely a lot nicer than the one I have, which is a non-existent yacht. So no complaints from me. I'm only mentioning this because I think the age of the boat is the reason for what happens next. We set sail on time and started getting out into the open sea. It felt like we were 1,000 miles away from the shore by 6 p.m., and the sun was getting lower in the sky. The view was breathtaking from the top of the boat. Nothing in sight all around us except a cargo ship way off into the distance. The water was a dark blue as the setting sun made its way past the perfectly straight line of water that looked like the edge of the earth. There was a table, a few chairs to sit in, shade in some spots, and complimentary champagne. Dinner would be in half an hour. So, we and the other couple shared some champagne and stories before dinner, wondering how we got so lucky to end up there. Or so we thought. Dinner had come and gone, and everything was going great. Around nine, my partner and I headed to the tiny room to start getting ready for some sleep. The boat was going to anchor down in the morning, and we wanted to take a swim for some exercise to start the day, so we needed some rest. We were out by 11 p.m., then woke up again at 1 a.m. to a loud banging, an alarm going off, and a red light illuminating our room. I wish that what I am describing was just a nightmare. It was, in fact, not. We scrambled out of bed, barely dressed, terrified, and half asleep. My girlfriend ran to open our cabin door, and as soon as she did, the first mate and the other couple were wide-eyed in the tiny hallway, putting on life jackets and handing us some. There was a smell of smoke in the air, and I thought at that moment that this was an overreaction. There is no way this is happening. And if it is, it isn't that bad, right? Wrong. We booked it out of the hallway to the deck of the boat to notice that one half of the boat was on fire and realized the boat was sinking. The only light we had was from the fire and the stars. Anything outside a 50-foot radius was completely black. An abyss. The water was glowing orange around the boat as the small waves peaked and made kissing sounds only to be overshadowed by the roaring of the fire and the occasional pop and crack from parts of the boat melting in the flames. The normal calm the sound of waves usually brings was slowly becoming the worst sound I could ever hear. We were surrounded by complete darkness and would be for the next few hours. The captain was preparing the emergency raft. It was inflatable and just required a pull on a string. With a strong pull, the raft was quickly inflating to become a four foot by six foot bright yellow, a flimsy vessel that would keep us afloat until help came. They threw it off to the side of the boat near a small set of stairs that dipped into the water. A small rope held the raft close to the stairs. Meanwhile, all I could do was stand in shock with tears running down my face. 
all I could think about was my dogs. Still, not sure that this was as bad as it seems. We still have to be close to land. Boats put out an SOS. I'm getting on the life raft so I don't burn alive or drown. The captain and the first mate were talking quietly to each other. That caused me to panic some. What are they saying to each other that they can't say to us? They begin looking back and forth between the raft and the fire. At this point, I am able to figure out that the series of events that are unfolding are not ones that are working out in our favor. I hear the first mate curse loudly, and by this time we are all looking over to them to find out what we need to do. Why are we not moving into the raft yet? The fire is growing and smoke is filling the air. Maybe ten seconds pass before the captain shouts, Everyone onto the raft one at a time. I was waiting for him to say, Women and children first, because this felt like it was straight out of the Titanic. The first mate got into the raft and reached his hand up to Carol, while Robert held her hand to help her down the small set of metal stairs. Robert was next, and they both sat down on the raft. Then I climbed down the stairs, followed by my partner. The captain launched an oar, yes, one oar into the raft, untied the rope, and hopped in. He gave us a push off the side of the boat as best he could. We didn't get very far with that, but the first mate had been trying to use the singular oar to paddle us away from the flames and smoke. The first few minutes while trying to get a distance, nobody said anything. Robert was comforting Carol, and I was just staring off at the boat, anticipating a huge explosion, like in the movies. However, that never happened. The boat just burned and burned, and after about 20 minutes, the fire was diminishing due to the water that was quickly sinking the boat. This seemed like an actual nightmare, and I didn't even know at that point that it was only going to get worse. The fire had been out for only a few minutes, and the only way any of us could see one another was by the dim light of the moon. Of course, the moon was not even close to full that night. It barely lit up anything. You could maybe see a foot in front of you. Anything past that was just black, never-ending darkness. The first mate made his way around, securing our life jackets tightly. I appreciated the concern, but I told him I would be fine without a life jacket. The captain had been digging around in a box that was built into the side of the raft. He pulled out what looked like an extra piece of the raft's material and a bright orange flare gun. He maneuvered slowly to the empty side of the boat, lifted up the side, and that's when we heard the gurgling of air leaving the raft and hitting the water. There is no way there's a hole in this raft. He tried a few times to pull the side up out of the water, and each time the weight of his body and inability to get any leverage to use force to keep the underside up and out of the water long enough to try to patch the rip. The first mate tried to assist, but it all seemed like a waste of effort. Finally, in desperation, they peeled a clear seal off the side of the extra raft material, pulled up the side as hard as they could, and reached all the way over to slap the patch on. Unfortunately, this was not a success. They were unable to patch the rip in the side of the life raft. The only thing keeping us out of the pitch black ocean was slowly sinking. After a few minutes of exchanging cuss words, tight tugs, and a few words of encouragement, it was time to get real about the situation that was happening. We were about to become stranded in the ocean, just floating there with miles of nothingness around us, above us, and below us. After all, we were close to the southern end of the Mariana Trench, which is known to be the deepest part of the ocean. This gives me chills to think about. Miles away from the next sign of human life, the raft was losing its air, and the inflated sides were becoming soft to the touch, squishing easily under the pressure of my hand. The flare gun went off. It was a silent star shooting way up into the sky, 
and then a pop like a firework. The light was so bright from the flare. I could see regret and fear in the older couple's eyes. I knew at this point that we had about 30 minutes until the raft was just a piece of flat, yellow rubber and nylon. Nothing much was said in those last few minutes, other than we learned we were almost 100 miles off the coast of where we departed, and nobody, another boat, or the Coast Guard had responded to our SOS. Luckily, we knew that the area of the ocean we were in was considered a high traffic area for cargo and importing ships, so it was unlikely that we would never be found. It was probably just going to take a while to be found. Still, in the dead of night floating helplessly amongst the creatures of the sea, for even just one minute, is one minute too long. It wasn't much longer before we were all submerged and watching water take over the flat raft as it sank a foot, two feet, three feet, and by four feet, it was a pale dark yellow mass losing its brightness to the sea. It was barely visible, but I had to watch it to see just how far it would go until it disappeared. That was a mistake, because when I tell you that, that freaked me out more than anything. I mean it. We all stayed close to each other just floating in the small waves. I don't know if I purposely tried to scare myself, but all I could imagine was the sea creature swimming below us. No matter how deep, I knew at every moment there was likely something there. I am an avid fan of Shark Week, so I knew that sharks become more active at night dusk and dawn. We were just at the whim of the ocean waves. I didn't care that I was tired or hungry. I could only envision myself at any second being dragged deep into the ocean by a shark to drown to death. Still barely alive when it let go of me, but too far down to float up fast enough to get a gasp of life-saving oxygen. Or, even worse than this happening to me, happening to the love of my life, who remained brave and stoic during this whole ordeal. If I had to watch something bad happen to her, I would rather it just be me. Four hours and two flares had gone by when I could see the sky start to lighten up. The sun was rising. For some reason, the thought of daylight was comforting. I was still going to be floating around, but I could see now. Dawn was here, and I could see if there were any threats around us, or if boats were passing by that were able to see the wreckage of our flare signals. Help could see us. It wouldn't be long now until I am on dry land. Again. Wrong. The sun was getting higher into the sky. Despite everything, it was beautiful. The pinks and oranges from the ocean that was no longer black, but blue. I decided to do a 360 and turn around to see everything around us. That's when it happened. My biggest fear of free-floating. Something bumped my submerged legs. Something big. I screamed a blood-curdling scream, and the only words I could get out of my mouth were, Big my leg. Shark. At that moment, I had no idea if it was really a shark. I just assumed the worst because obviously, after this whole adventure, the worst happens to me. And what else would I expect? Shark week comes in handy again. I remember to try not to panic and that they are attracted to shiny jewelry I decided to take out my earrings and I tossed them into the open water away from us. The idea was that the shark would go after my earrings. It sounds dumb when I say it out loud now, but I would have tried anything. I just sat there and tried not to kick my legs, but also tried not to lay on my back and float, trying not to resemble a fat seal. We were all just darting our eyes and bodies around to look for any signs it was still around. All of a sudden, Robert let out a yelp. He too had been bumped. 
A quick splash at the top of the surface about five feet away revealed a large fin. We were still unable to tell if it was a shark by the fin or a dolphin, but I don't know much about dolphins. I didn't know if they lurked around the way this thing was. I guess the earrings didn't work. I don't know why I thought that was such a genius plan. We all came in closer to each other, hoping to give the image that we looked bigger to the fish. I would be lying to say that each time someone accidentally kicked me while trying to keep afloat that I didn't freak out, but I did, and each time scared me more. Some time had passed, and there was no sight of fins breaking the surface or any large dark masses swimming below us. I don't think we would be able to really tell, since we were basically eye level with the water. But everything seemed calm for the time being. We were all hungry, complaining of hunger and thirst a while later. I figured at this point it must have been 10 a.m. Already in the blazing sun, my girlfriend was sunburnt. Her face was beet red, and her lips dry and cracked from exposure, dehydration, and salt water. I eventually pulled off my shirt and used it to provide some shade for her. I was shirtless underneath my life jacket. Whoever rescued us was in for a treat. The thought of not being rescued before we perished to the bottom of the ocean crossed my mind, and I was starting to spiral. Everyone was trying to remain positive, but not me. I guess I was the only one who witnessed every single mishap that led us up to that moment. Screw toxic positivity. Screw good vibes only. We are in a serious situation, and despite being surrounded by never-ending water, none of us had a single drop since at least nine hours ago. Is nobody else concerned about dehydration? I knew I was getting snippy with people who didn't deserve it and have their own way of dealing with things, but I was having trouble seeing the bright side. All of a sudden, a loud horn filled the air. It was like music to my ears. Help was close. Behind Carol was a red cargo ship in the distance, maybe half a mile away. The captain shot the last flare and the cargo ship's horn rang twice. They saw us. They were coming. The mood shifted, and all the fears of megalodons and third-degree sunburns were gone. There was a collective sigh of relief. Immediately, I started planning my move for when we got to land. I was going to hit up a drive through slam a gallon of Pedialyte take a Xanax and hold on to my partner and our dogs, and vow to never set foot on a boat again. The cargo ship threw over some floating devices, and we held on as a Coast Guard helicopter flew in from the other side of the boat. The wind from the helicopter sprayed salt water in our eyes and shot droplets at my face that felt like tiny bee stings. They lowered a man down to the water, and he attached each person to what I believe was a stretcher, one at a time, and reeled us up to the chopper. When we all made it inside of the helicopter, and before we began the flight back to land, we hovered above our wreckage site. It was some ways off from where we were picked up. I looked down and thought about the odds of all this happening, and the moment I dropped the raffle ticket into the bucket a few months ago, and I was filled with regret. I was checking the remnants of the wreckage when I noticed a large black mass under the water. Then I noticed another, a smaller mass, then two more. The wreckage was swarming with sharks. The Coast Guard was looking out the side with me and made a comment. This area is notorious for shark activity. You all are lucky to have made it out alive and with all limbs intact. There were quite a few sharks swimming near the area we picked you up. The chopper was loud and hurting my ears as we took a hard swoop left. I just laid my head back and looked at my partner, who was applying Neosporin to her lips. 
and the others from the boat removing their life jackets so they could use a stethoscope to listen to their heart or lungs or whatever. I didn't really respond to the Coast Guard guy about the sharks. I couldn't bring myself to comment on it. I just started to unbuckle my life vest and asked if they had a shirt I could borrow. Every weekend, my family goes over to my grandma's house for dinner. She lives right by the field behind my old middle school. Along the outside edges of the campus is a long paved path where I like to go on late evening walks or bike rides, especially during the summer. Those trails hold some of my best childhood memories. I live in Oregon, so most of my childhood was spent doing outdoor activities with my siblings. Back in the summer of 2012, when I was about seven or eight years old, we were visiting my grandma one night when we decided to go for a walk. It was a warm summer night, and it just felt nice to get out. I decided to bring my bike, as I liked to ride ahead of everyone, so that I would have time to ride around the empty parking lot before everyone else got back. As I rode along the trail, the sun began to set behind the trees on the opposite side of the field. It was getting late, but if I hurried, I would make it back by dark with still some extra time to ride in the parking lot. I reached the long chain-link fence, which separated the field from the parking lot. I went through the gate and began pedaling quickly around each section of the area, being careful to avoid speed bumps. As I neared the old brick building, I noticed a man with a small dog standing in the grass to the left of the school. I didn't think anything of this, until he waved and called out to me. Hey there, kid. He called in a raspy voice. This man was about six feet tall, with long, messy brown hair that was turning gray. He wore a pair of glasses that looked like they belonged on Jeffrey Dahmer, and looked to be about fifty. Just trying to be friendly, I waved back at him. Don't get me wrong, my parents had taught me about all the dangers of talking to people you don't know, but this guy seemed friendly enough, and he had a dog. No way he meant me any harm, right? What could go wrong? You come here often? He asked. Not sure what to say, but still trying to remain friendly, I told him, Yeah, sometimes. My grandma lives in the neighborhood. My first mistake. He nodded and asked, Where's your grandma? Being a dumb little kid, I explained to him how I rode ahead of everyone else, and they were still catching up. This is when things started to get weird. He gave me a smile and asked me, Have you ever found money over here? Kids drop their money all the time. No, I haven't, I answered, still not thinking anything of this strange encounter. Ah, uh, well, I found ten dollars lying over there in the grass just a couple days ago. There's money everywhere. If you come over here, I'll show you, he replied, grinning even bigger. I began to get a bit nervous, not because I was scared of this guy or anything, but because I had pretty severe social anxiety and really didn't want to spend too long talking to him. Just then I heard my mom shouting behind me, What are you doing? Get over here! I turned to see her standing by the fence behind me with a very angry but concerned look on her face. I looked back at the man. I gotta go. I'll see you later, I told him, turning and beginning to pedal away. I took one last look at him, but he was no longer smiling. He just stared back at me with a look of pure hatred. When we got back, my mom gave me a huge lecture about how I should never talk to strangers and how dangerous that could have been. Looking back on the situation, I don't know what would have happened if my mom hadn't showed up, or if I had actually gone with the man to look for money. I never saw the man again. I have no idea who he was or what his intentions were, but I can tell you, 
they were not the best. When you are alone, always remember to be aware of your surroundings and be careful who you talk to. Whatever your beliefs as far as the paranormal, I'll just say that these two instances are 100% true. I experienced them. I have always believed in the paranormal because I feel, how could anyone be positive that something doesn't exist? Even if I haven't seen little gray men or Bigfoot, hundreds of other people claim they have. Even so, I have been blessed or cursed with a very practical, analytical mind. I watch real ghost hunting shows with a grain of salt, always asking how this could have been faked. Many times it is fake, but not all. Many things have happened to me that I dismissed as something else, so I'm only telling you these that I can't dismiss. My first experience occurred at a famous seaside restaurant in California. It's been featured on numerous ghost hunting shows, as well as on Unsolved Mysteries. I lived about 30 minutes from the place, but I hadn't been there. I finally got to have dinner there with a boyfriend. I was fascinated, asking the employees about their experiences with their infamous specter. See, I was happy to have a paranormal experience, as long as I wasn't alone. At some point in the evening, I had to use the restroom. I asked my boyfriend to walk with me after I realized the restroom was outside the dining room and down a long, deserted hallway. He didn't want to wait right outside the women's room door, but he waited near the entrance to the hallway. So I was in there, alone. Just my luck, no one else had to use the restroom. I went into the second of two stalls and did my thing. And suddenly, the hairs on the back of my neck began standing up. I didn't hear anything. It was just a feeling. So I told myself that I was just being paranoid because of the dark, scary hallway, and I'd psyched myself out. Still, I was very relieved when a minute later someone else came into the restroom, and I was no longer alone. She went into the other stall, and I came out of mine and washed my hands. That's when I noticed there was no one in the other stall. The door was resting open as it had been, clearly empty. There was nowhere else anyone could go in the small restroom. Yet, I had heard all the noises. The outside door squeaking open and closed. Footsteps. And someone closing and locking the stall door right next to me. Yet, I was completely alone. Heart beating out of my chest, I ran out of there, down the hall, and into my boyfriend's arms. Months later, I learned that the women's restroom was one of the most haunted places in that building. I'm glad I hadn't known that before I went in there, or I never would have been able to relieve myself. This next story happened in a house I had bought with that same boyfriend. It was a small house built in the 40s. There was nothing creepy about the house, but it wasn't long before we had some strange little things happen. I heard a man clear his throat behind me when I was home alone. Some items I'd put on the floor and leaned up against the wall got knocked over. Little things like that. But the weirdest thing that happened to me in that house were the knocks. They always seemed to happen when I was home alone. In whatever room I was, there were two loud knocks on the window. It sounded exactly like someone outside came up to the window and knocked on it. Always two good, loud raps. The first time I was lying in bed one morning and I heard two knocks on my bedroom window. A quick knock-knock. The thing is, my bedroom was in the very back of the house facing the backyard, and the backyard was not accessible except from inside the house. It was a fully fenced, very long backyard, and anyone who came from the street in front couldn't get to it because it was a very narrow passage that we had blocked to keep anyone out. I had been awake when it happened, so I got out of bed and went to the window to see who it could have possibly been. 
Of course, there was no one there. There was no one anywhere in the backyard. The next time it happened, I was in the kitchen, home alone again, and there were two wraps on the kitchen window. It was daytime again, and our kitchen faced the carport. Of course, there was nobody there. After a few more times, I told my boyfriend and my older son about it. Neither of them believed me. They teased me about it, saying I kept dreaming that people were knocking on the windows. So one day, while I was taking a shower, the knocks happened right on the shower window. It was so close to me and so unexpected, I actually jumped. This time, I was not home alone, so I thought maybe my boyfriend or my son was playing a joke on me, so I kind of laughed it off. I knew that it would be hard to get to that window, though, because it faced the blocked, narrow side of the house, and right outside of it were rose bushes with thorns. Later, they both swore they hadn't done it. They were very serious, and I could tell that they were telling the truth. They also said they had not heard the knocks, so they still didn't believe me. Only one time do I remember it happening at night. This time, I was in the third bedroom that we used as an office in the back of the house. It also faced the inaccessible backyard, and it was late and dark. My curtains were closed, and I was doing something on the computer. When the two loud knocks hit that window, I was too scared to look out the curtains. This only went on for a few months, but it happened a lot, and every time it occurred in whatever room I happened to be in at the time. I never heard it from another room. No one else heard it either. Until one night. On this night, I had gone to bed and my boyfriend and my son were in the living room watching a movie. The next day, they told me that at about 1 a.m., they heard two quick, loud knocks on the living room window. There was no knock on the front door, which was right next to the window. They looked out the window, and of course, no one was there. It finally happened to someone else, in a room that I did not happen to be in. And after that, they finally believed me. The following story occurred in 2001. During this time, I remember it being cold and we finally decided to pack up our Christmas decorations. My sister and I were two rowdy teenagers living in a single-parent household. Our father had passed away a few years back, so our mother took on the full responsibility of raising us by herself. My mom worked as a flight attendant, which made her time with us very limited. However, we understood why. Everyone was struggling to cope with this new life. In the middle of dinner one night, our mom mentions to us that she's going away for a few days for work-related reasons. My sister Cleo sighs in disappointment and places her fork on her plate. I quickly pinch her arm and remind her to have a better attitude about everything. Cleo is my younger sister. At times, she can be very disconnected from reality. She didn't understand that she wasn't the only person that had to sacrifice things. After my quick scolding, Cleo readjusts herself at the dinner table and apologizes. Mom smiles and continues to explain. Since she was leaving for a period of three days, our mom felt more comfortable with us staying at our aunt's house until she got back. Cleo and I look at each other in astonishment. You know how everyone has that one family member's house that you dread going to? Well, in this situation... That person was our Aunt Kathy. Was she kind? Yes, but her lifestyle would be considered a little unorthodox to most. Aunt Kathy was known for hosting outlandish events and always had at least two boyfriends. She had a son named Chase, who passed away last year. During our childhood, our aunt would host parties and gatherings at her house, and Chase would stay in his room the entire time. She insisted that he was an introvert, but every time I visited that house, 
I felt a strange and unexplainable feeling. Despite all of those things, I swallow my pride and nod in agreement as my mother finishes explaining all of the details. I could tell that Cleo was very annoyed that we had to leave. She tried to convince our mom that we could watch over ourselves, but Cleo had broken that trust by inviting a boy over numerous times. Thanks a lot, Cleo. The next day, we pack a bag and wait on the front porch for our aunt to come get us. Mom had already left early in the morning for work. After about 15 minutes, Aunt Kathy begins to pull in the driveway. I still remember that car. It was a silver 1999 Toyota Camry. We place our bags into the trunk and sit in the back seat. Aunt Kathy shouts our names in excitement and starts a conversation. We discuss school, our mom, and of course, boys. But whenever we would mention our cousin Chase, her response was short, or she would smile through the rearview mirror. After a semi-long car ride, we arrive at the house. Green shrubs were lined across the lawn, along with a barbecue grill. As we walk to the door, I look up and discover someone staring down at me through a window. The curtains jerk shut immediately after. I couldn't tell who it was, but I assumed it was one of her boyfriends. As we walk inside, I notice that all of the lights are off. Although it was daytime, it seemed eerily quiet and a dark hue shadowed the house. I guess this was oblivious to Cleo because she headed straight into the living room to watch TV. Aunt Kathy asks to speak with me briefly in the kitchen. The look on her face alone made me interested in what she had to tell me. She whispers to me and explains that she had been distraught since the passing of her son. I hug her in consolation as she sobs on my shoulder. I understood completely how she felt. Losing someone that close to you is heartbreaking. Aunt Kathy begins to tell me that sometimes it feels like he is still here, especially when she wakes up in the middle of the night. My heart dropped to my stomach. Even though I knew I had to ask her the following question, I wasn't prepared for the answer. I asked my aunt about the person in the window upstairs as we were entering the house. She raises her head from my shoulder and looks at me in confusion. She had no idea what I was talking about. Aunt Kathy explained that she had been living by herself ever since Chase died. At that moment, I tried to convince myself that I didn't see anything in the window. Everything happened pretty quickly. Aunt Kathy insisted that it could have been her cat, but as the day continued, I realized how illogical that idea was. I think I know the difference between a cat and a human. During our entire stay at the house, nothing happened. As the last day approached, the idea of something eerie going on had diminished almost completely. Cleo and I hug Aunt Kathy goodbye and get into the Jeep with our mom. Before we drive off, I notice two things. Aunt Kathy standing in the doorway waving goodbye, and the same figure I saw three days before, standing in the window. It seemed to be more of a silhouette, and was black in color, with soulless eyes. I turn to Cleo and tell her to look up, but when she does, the figure disappeared. We never visited that house again. When I finished college, the Great Recession was at its height. Despite graduating with a high GPA and good internship experience, it took me two years to find a full-time job in my field. During those two years, I felt isolated adrift, and lost. In retrospect, it makes sense that this was when I brushed up against what may have been my first ghost. Newspaper articles at the time were full of stories of boomerang kids, young adults who moved back home to ride out the economic hardship with their parents. I couldn't stand for that to be me, though. 
I had just broken up with my boyfriend, and I didn't think I could handle the pity, the claustrophobia, and the further sense of failure I would feel starting my adult life in my childhood bedroom. Instead, I worked three jobs to make ends meet. I could pay the rent, but I swiftly fell into a state of depression. I kept odd hours, and it was difficult to find time to see friends. One of my jobs was with a youth psychologist. I was paid to transcribe recordings the psychologist made of his evaluations of patients. Because of confidentiality concerns, I'm not going to talk about anything specific that was in those recordings. One thing I noticed, though, was how many of the kids grew up in small, dying towns in the rural areas of our state. I lived in our major city and hadn't spent a lot of time exploring outside of it. Out of loneliness and depression, I started using my free time to drive. Sometimes it was aimless. Sometimes I drove near the towns where the kids in the recordings were from. I passed ghost towns and isolated mountain ranges and old mines. Once, I got my car stuck in the mud outside an abandoned cemetery and had to hike back to the road to flag someone down who could help me. The emptiness of those places seemed to cling to me. Sometimes I could stop my car in the middle of the road, take off my shoes, feel the hot asphalt under my feet, and stare at the horizon for an hour before someone else passed by. Even when I got back home, it was like I couldn't wash the desert off me. I felt changed. There was something else I noticed about the psych evaluations, too. Almost all of the kids talked about the supernatural. They had ghost stories, UFO stories, and a few even had skinwalker stories, all from these areas that I had been driving through. I was never a believer in the supernatural, but after having spent time in the places they lived and felt that eerie loneliness for myself, I could see why they felt that way. There's a major river in the southern part of our state that seemed to appear in a lot of kids' stories. When I was in an independent bookstore one day, I found an older book full of stories and legends about the river. On a whim, I decided to buy it. Most of the stories were forgettable, but one that stuck out to me was a journal entry written by a miner who lived in the area in the 1800s. He said that one night in camp, he looked over toward the river and saw a group of ghosts walking out of the water and onto the shore. There were no details beyond that, no description of the people he saw or any indication of how he knew they were ghosts. He said nothing about what he did afterward, but it stuck in my mind. For weeks, I thought about ghosts that walked up out of a river and disappeared into the night. It wasn't long before I decided I needed to see the place for myself. It was far. The river is on the border of another state and lies along one of the least driven highways in the country. I felt uneasy as I was driving toward it, but exhilarated too. It's hard to explain, but something about reading those ghost stories put a sense of possibility back into the world. I believed in next to nothing at this point in my life, but maybe I could believe in this. It even seemed likely. The world felt dark, and this seemed like a confirmation of that feeling. When I arrived at the river, there was no one there. I parked my car, hiked through the sagebrush, and looked around. It was just a river of muddy water. I sat down on the bank and thought about my life. Why was I going nowhere? When would this end? Had my boyfriend seen this looming nothingness in me, and that was why he had left? I was 24 years old, and I was looking for ghosts. I had maybe even become a ghost myself. Sometimes at night, I felt like I was beginning to fade at the edges, like whatever had made me, me, was gone. Frustrated with myself and with the sun beginning to set, I stood up to leave. I walked back to my car, dreading the long drive home in the dark. When I reached my car, I almost missed it. The light was fading and my mind was on other things, but I happened to fumble my keys getting them into the lock, and as I stooped down to pick them up, I saw it. A set of wet footprints leading to my car. 
I stood up slowly, tracing their path with my eyes, but I knew where they were going to start. At the edge of the river. My whole body felt cold and light. It was the biggest moment of unreality I have ever experienced, and it washed over me like a wave. The footprints were half-faded, but very definite outlines of what looked like cowboy boots leading from the river and right up to the passenger door of my car. Then they vanished. There was no sign of where they had gone, and no sound either, just the buzz of insects at the water's edge. I didn't wait around to see anything else. I jumped into the driver's seat, started the engine, and peeled out. I made sure the doors were locked, but somehow I knew it hadn't been a living person who had made those marks. I had hiked out a little bit, but I would have noticed if there had been someone else there, especially if they had approached my car, which was on higher ground and more visible. The adrenaline kept me going the entire drive home. When I got back, I called my friend, and we talked for an hour about unimportant gossip. I ordered takeout from the most basic, normal-sounding restaurant I could think of. I put a sitcom on in the background. I don't think I slept at all that night. And shortly after, I was offered a full-time salaried job in my field in a much bigger city. I moved that summer, and I haven't been back to that river since. I also don't feel comfortable in the desert, or in any isolated place. I prefer the busy noise of the city, where I can surround myself with friends, and it's difficult to get too lost in my own thoughts. But I know now, I know, there are ghosts. I work for a special unit with the Sheriff's Department. The official designation is the Electronic Monitoring Unit. We install, monitor, and enforce all rules and policies designated when given a GPS tether. I am sure when I say ankle monitor, most people will understand that a little clearer. Most of the time is spent tracking people, making sure they are within their court-ordered curfew, etc. Like all police work, nothing is routine, but it's not exactly all PD live or whatever true cop show you can think of. I have been on some exciting calls working in Tether. When someone attempts to cut one of these bad boys off, we get an alert immediately. The rush to get the person before they get the Tether off is intense. It's even more intense when they do remove it and you find some later. Manhunting is the most exciting. I'm sure you've all read The Most Dangerous Game. I have been on some strange calls, too. Every police officer has one or two stories bordering on paranormal. Back in my early days working the jail, I used to hear noises during midnight shift when I was ordered over to work, and not inmate noises, those I was used to. I mean banging sounds coming from the hallway closets where linen and toilet paper is kept. Once I passed a door and heard what I thought was a weapon going off inside, I probably had to change my uniform after that. It was really like someone kicking the door from the inside as hard as they could. It took a minute, but I did check inside, to find nothing of course. Back in 1993, our department lost a sergeant in the line of duty. He was making normal security rounds in one of the old jails downtown when an inmate took him hostage with a weapon. You can imagine how terrifying this would be for anyone, but you are not supposed to face anyone with a weapon inside of the jail. It is still not known how that weapon came into the jail. Most think the inmate somehow got it fished to him from the outside, or it was an officer that brought the weapon in for the inmate. That is a possibility that I hate to consider. One day I was working that jail, doing normal security rounds. I remember seeing a shadow walking down the long concrete hallway. I did not think much of it at the time, until I remembered that the hallway didn't have any outlets, left or right. Meaning, 
that I saw this man walking down the hall. I looked down, and when I looked back, he was gone. I went to look for him, and he was nowhere to be found. It took me a while to put the pieces together. I asked my partner what floor had the sergeant been killed on. The one we are on right now, is what he said. The jail is one thing, but having some creepy stuff happen out in the outside world is another. I go through a lot of houses in my job. You could not believe how people live out here. Think about how you were raised and look around your home. It is not the same where I work. I will not say where, but it is a major U.S. city with major U.S. problems. Poor problems, racial problems, and awful sports teams to boot. Let me set up this call for you. My partner and I are in the office, monitoring and maintaining our population on Tether, which is well into the 1000s. We have more people on GPS than in all of our jails combined. My partner gets an alert that someone on his caseload has a low battery. These devices are solid. The battery life lasts about three to four days if you charge it for two hours. Compared to our cell phones, that seems reasonable, but you just can't get some of these people to follow the rules, which is why they are in this situation in the first place. My partner goes through the process of trying to get his guy to start charging. Calling will not work. Can't get a hold of any of his friends or family either. The last resort is calling the actual device on his leg. The company we use that develops the GPS tethers has a monitoring center, open 24 hours. We can call them and be patched through to the device. Finally, we get a hold of him. Just charge your tether, man. My partner yells into the phone. It's hard to hear the subject's response, but it sounds like he acknowledges it. He is staying at a friend's house right now in the southwest part of the city, which of course we can see. He of course lost his charge cord for the device. My partner decides, since we are pretty close to him, why don't we just run another out to him? Sounds like a plan, I think, and start getting my gear on. There was nothing strange about the house when we pulled up. Normal looking two-story corner house with crap all over the overgrown yard and several cars in various states of decay. I checked an app on my county-issued cell phone that shows me where the GPS points are on anyone that wears one. I just wanted to make sure it was still communicating and that he's still at this house. It looked like a yes for both. My partner gets to the door, knocks, and asks for Mike. I'm at the side of the house watching the side door, but also keeping my eyes on my partner. I hear a female voice call for Mike. Another male voice is speaking to my partner, too. At this point, since contact was made, and I didn't feel like anyone's going to burst out the side or back of the house, I make my way back up to my partner. I now identify the two people he's speaking with. The male is maybe in his early 20s, the female about the same. Both are what you would call in rough shape had something of a zombie vibe to them. Strung out, if you get me. As I'm walking up, I can also surmise that the guy is telling my partner something to the effect that the guy known as Mike is not in fact at his home. My partner calmly tells him that we know he's here. We just saw his last tracking point, which puts him right on top of us. Literally, so to speak. I believe he was upstairs. If he's not here, why did the female call for him? Again, we are just here to give him a charge cord. No one was in trouble. This kid starts to get shifty. Here go the eyes peeking around, the rubbing of the hands, and the flat out lies. Look, he was here maybe 10 minutes ago, but he ain't here now. I don't let dopers in my home. Okay. Bullcrap aside, we still have to figure this out. I want to go back to our vehicle, look at the tracking, see what's going on. It is possible that we could have just missed him. The tether calls out a location every five minutes, 
It's not live tracking. He may have just left when we pulled up. However unlikely, it was possible. All I had to do was wait for his next point. Ding. The point is in. Let's see where this low charger is. Well, he is still at the house. Again, we go to the front. And again, the kid says he's not here. That he just left. I look at my phone, now getting more frustrated. What the... I say out loud. Now there is a strap tamper alert for Mike. This means that our guy may have started to cut the tether off. I'm confused at how all of this had gone. My partner starts grilling the kid again. Look, cut the crap. Where is he? Still, the kid gives nothing up. I look around the area. Maybe this idiot did cut it off and throw it around the porch, and the alert just came in too late. I don't see anything, though, and I would have heard the alarm if he did cut it off. It's louder than some ambulance sirens. Something feels strange about this whole thing. The kid invites us in to look around, and we take him up on his offer. Nothing better than a consent to search a home. Once we get in, I am immediately taken back by the piss and cat feces smell of the home. There's literal trash in all rooms, like the doors can't even close because they are blocked by trash. This is going to be a nightmare to search through. I can tell you right now, I didn't go through any of those trash rooms. My partner and I cleared the bottom floor as best we could and started moving upstairs. This is where things get eerie. The staircase twisted. Odd for this type of home in this area. Like I said, I go through a lot of houses. It's just something you don't see that often. Once we reach the top, we are all of a sudden in the Stanley Hotel. In Stephen King's The Shining, it was known as the Overlook Hotel. The hallway stretched for an impossible length. The carpet was red with yellow triangles. I don't think there was carpet downstairs anywhere. The hairs are starting to stand up now. A feeling of unease is thick as the hallway juts in and out. There's a room every five feet or so, and there must have been six to seven rooms up there. That is just not possible for a house like that, and every single door was padlocked from the outside. I was beyond done trying to make anything add up with this situation. I told my partner to hold the downstairs so no one came up behind us. Since the doors were locked, I was not bothering with them. Once I got to the end of the hall, I gave up and turned around. I called my partner back to game plan. I think we are about done, I said. I don't know what's going on with this guy's device. Maybe he cut it and smashed it. Either way, I think we needed to get out of that house as soon as possible. As we are heading for the winding stairs, we both hear a low thump. We look at each other with that, did you hear that, facial expression. While we both stand still, I hear scratching noises, followed with another thumping. I don't believe either of us could tell which direction it was coming from. Weird, but could be anything at this point. I am still leaving, and as I'm passing a door, my heart stops. First, I see movement out of the corner of my eye. Slowly turning to my left, I'm looking directly into someone's eyeball, peering between the slightly opened door. Ten dirty fingers start poking out, trying to open the door. Imagine the lead character from the movie I mentioned earlier. Here's Mikey. This guy did not look like the person we were looking for. Who are you? I ask, embarrassed I couldn't tone down how shocked I was. That's him, my partner said. Once I snapped back to reality, I didn't think, just acted. I blasted that door Spartan style, sending our pal Mike across the room. After being taken into custody... We questioned him, and he said he got scared when he heard police were at the door. He hid 
and stupidly tried to cut the device off his leg. Pretty simple and thankfully safe outcome. After having some choice words with the kid we first dealt with, we brought our guy to jail. And that was that. But I'll never forget seeing that hallway for the first time. All those strange padlocked doors. And the eyeball staring at me from the darkness. I would like to start by saying that all the names in this story have been changed. Last year in 2021, I was living in a townhouse in New Mexico with my twin sister, we'll call her Carrie, and our two childhood best friends, Robbie and Izzy. The time in that house was full of your typical young adult ups and downs, but amplified by the turmoil of the pandemic. That house was full of good, bad, and ugly times, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. However, the last few months were absolutely terrible before I ended up leaving the state. Let me start with a little backstory. Carrie had been in a relationship with a man who we will call Jay. Jay and Carrie had a very unhealthy relationship, which ended with him being kicked out of our house after an altercation between him and Carrie. Police were called, and we thought that would be the end of it. Let's just say he didn't take being thrown out of the house and dumped too well. One day, on the off chance that I had a day off from work, I was in the kitchen most of the day doing some deep cleaning and self-care. While I was able to do the first part with ease, I could not for the life of me shake the feeling of being watched. I have struggled with anxiety symptoms due to PTSD, so I wrote this off as me just having a bad day. That was until Robbie came home, throwing the door open and shouting, Tell me why I saw Jay circling our block. I was in shock. I ran to the window looking over our street, and sure enough, Jay's car was speeding off. We told Carrie about it as soon as she got home from work that day, and she then revealed to myself, Robbie, and Izzy that Jay had been stalking her. I was not surprised given the details of this situation, as Carrie then told us about this next situation, which shook me to my core. One night, I want to say this story was about two weeks prior to him circling the block. Jay had been watching Carrie from afar while she went out with friends. Carrie must have forgot to lock the door when she came home. She says she woke up from a deep sleep and could have sworn that she saw someone standing over her bed. She said she didn't want to tell us right away because she had first assumed that she was dreaming or even having an episode of sleep paralysis. She would later receive a message from Jay scolding her for not talking to him when he came to the house the other night. That other night in question being the same night Carrie had come home. I started locking the doors even when everyone was home after Carrie told me that story. He was in the house while we were all sleeping sound in our beds, unaware that someone who we all didn't want anywhere near us was just sulking in the corner of my sister's bedroom. Watching over her, he could have done anything, but he chose to just watch her. That was deeply unsettling for all of us. Now I had already made the decision that once my lease was over, I was going to be moving in with my partner in a different state. At this point, we had all been packing up our things and preparing to move, go our separate ways. For more context, the landlord had installed a security system. Nothing high-tech by any means, but any time a door or window was open, the alarm would say in a robotic monotone voice, Side door open, or Back office window closed. Things like that. One night, I was home alone. Carrie was at dinner with Robbie and Robbie's mom, and I had no idea where Izzy was until this series of events happened. I was in my bedroom when suddenly I heard what sounded like tapping on my window. 
I figured it was the branches tapping like they usually did when there was even a small gust of wind. But the tapping was constant. Timed, almost. I still shrugged it off again, trying not to make myself anxious while I was alone in the house. It was then that I heard the security system go off. Back sliding door open. From the other room. Weird. We all usually come in through this side door when the kitchen and living room meet, as our front door was next to impossible to open from the outside. I brushed it off, thinking maybe Carrie and Robbie had forgotten their keys, and just came in through the back door. I called out from my bedroom. Carrie? Robbie? How was dinner? No response. As soon as the words left my mouth, the silence was deafening. I walked out to the hallways where all of the bedrooms led and called out again. Carrie? Robbie? Izzy? Again, nothing. I'm getting a bit freaked out now, but I'm thinking that they maybe didn't hear me. But that silence. I will never in my life forget the silence that rang through that house as I inched closer to the living room. As I'm finally standing in the living room, the only sounds I had heard in the span of a few minutes was my own heart beating out of my chest, my footsteps, and the AC kicking on. I finally reached the living room, and I had checked find my friends. To my horror, Carrie and Robbie were still at the restaurant with Robbie's mom. Izzy's phone had broken during this time too, so I had no clue where she was still. Knowing what I know at that moment, I called out one last time, but I couldn't bring myself to turn the corner and go into the kitchen. Izzy? Are you home? Silence again. I figured maybe I was just hearing things at that point. Then I heard it. Ugh. Came a hushed whisper from the kitchen, followed by the most hurried footsteps behind me going out the back door. I froze. Who was that? It all made sense at that point. The tapping on the window, the door opening with no noise from whoever opened it, and now this. I knew at that moment that I was not alone. Something came over me, and I snapped out of this frozen reaction. You better get out of my house! I screamed at the top of my lungs. I grabbed the baseball bat that I kept in the hall closet and started shouting that same sentence in ten different ways, opening all the doors and switching on all the lights, making sure that whoever this was had left. I finally made it to the kitchen and found out the sliding glass door was left wide open by whoever came into it. As soon as the adrenaline had worn off, the shock then set in. I booked it out of the house, locking the doors before throwing open my car door and ripping out the driveway without putting on my seatbelt. I called all my roommates, whose phone still worked. I later found out that Izzy had actually left town for the weekend, and I had missed that conversation. So I know whoever was in the house was not my sister or either of my other two roommates. Robbie called the police as soon as we got off the phone. Of course, there wasn't much they could do because nothing was stolen, and I didn't see who was in my home uninvited. I drove to my co-worker's house, and I broke down telling her what happened, and I waited for her to update me on what she and Carrie were going to do. They opted to stay at the hotel with Robbie's mom that night. I don't know who it was that broke into my house that night. Was it Jay? Some drunk college kid who stumbled into our yard, thinking it was their place? Someone with more sinister intentions, who got caught at the right time? I am not sure. I think that is what keeps me up sometimes when I think too deeply about that night. I know it wasn't an anxiety-induced thing. I saw the door, and I heard the whisper at the footsteps hurrying out the same door they came in. I am just happy that I live with my partner in a different state now, 
in a relatively safe neighborhood. But even that, some nights, is not enough to allow me to feel safe when I am home alone. Last year, my family and I were driving back from my grandparents' house over seven hours away. It had been a long trip as traffic had been bad and we had to make frequent stops for food and let our family dog out to go to the bathroom. Finally, we were on the freeway closest to my house and the trip was almost over. My mom, brother, and I were all so relieved to almost be home. My dad had been on a business trip and unable to join us, which sucked, but ultimately left a little more leg room in the packed car. Everything was smooth sailing with my brother and I in La La Land, watching YouTube or playing games and keeping my mom awake. Suddenly, the cars in front of us began to slow down and come to a stop. We naturally followed suit, slowing down and keeping an eye out for what traffic or accident was up ahead. We saw some cars begin to swerve and drive away down another lane, fast. Odd, we thought, but nothing to be worried about. That's when I realized, of the two lanes on our side of the road, only the one closest to the median was stopped. We weren't sure exactly what happened, so we stayed in the stopped lane. That's when my mom suddenly locked all the doors to the car. I looked at her, confused and wondering what she saw. My brother in the back seat had begun looking around, confused and worried. I realized my mom must have seen something further up the road than I could see. I asked what was going on, but my mom didn't need to answer. The car in front began to try to pull away, but wasn't able to. That's when I saw him. A random man in the middle of the freeway banging and trying to open people's doors to their cars. My eyes were fixated on the man, and my heart began to race. My mom began to make the move to get out of there, but it was too late. The man ran from the car in front of us to my mom's door. He looked scruffy and disheveled. He began slamming on my mom's window, begging for us to let him in. My mom began yelling at the man to go away through the closed windows as she tried to pull away. My brother and I were frozen in fear, unaware what this man wanted to do to us. My mom managed to pull away a few feet before the man then jumped onto the hood of our car and began slamming his fists into the windshield. My mom screamed, and I just sat there horrified. I had never felt this type of fear before. We all like to think that when fight or flight kicks in, that we'll be the hero. But I sat there helpless as this man threatened my family. The man demanded incoherently that we drive with him on our hood. My mom then saw multiple cop cars pull up behind us, with two officers running up to apprehend the man. He jumped from our hood and hopped the five-foot median. We saw the police draw their weapons and subdue him on the other side of the median, as my mom slammed on the gas and sped away. We were in shock, and I couldn't believe what had just happened. I listened to Being Scared, Let's Read, and other true scary stories, and never thought I would be face to face with a situation straight from a nightmare. It was only several miles later that my mom felt safe enough to pull off to the side of the road and called my dad and then the police to report what happened. The officers were incredibly kind and told us that the man was in police custody and asked if we were okay. My dad, however, was panicked. Everything he loved was in that car, he told us, and he was so glad that we were safe. That's when we realized, had this man had a weapon, he most likely would have tried to use it. I began to tear up realizing that we may have narrowly escaped a crazed man with our lives. My mom got a call the next day from the officer that had ran up from behind us and stopped the man. We were so incredibly grateful. My respect for law enforcement has always been strong, and without them, I don't know what we would have done, or if I would be here to tell this story. Thanks for listening, and of course our dog was fine, sleeping peacefully the entire time.
For 22 years, I have made myself believe this disturbing series of events did not happen to me. I have successfully convinced myself that this was all imagined. Our minds and souls have an amazing ability to protect us from psychological damage. Then I spoke with a friend that I haven't seen in a long time. The same friend I allegedly experienced this event with. He confirmed the whole thing. I'll do my best to accurately present the entire story, as raw as it happened. And apparently, it did happen. This story revolves around a Ouija board. I hate to even type or say those words. I will not and have not touched one since 1997. As previously stated, that was 22 years ago, making me 13 at the time. An age where I believe most of us start to branch out in curiosities. It's no longer just having sleepovers with friends, playing various video game consoles, or getting into high school sports. Girls were starting to become appealing. In my time, professional wrestling was starting to really take off. A group of my friends were diving into horror movies and scary stories. This is something that always appealed to me. Ever since reading scary stories to tell in the dark, I was hooked. This series of books came out when I was around eight years old. They sold them at our Scholastic Book Fair. Looking back, these stories and illustrations were way too intense for eight-year-olds, in my opinion, but I sure did enjoy them. We like being scared. We like to feel something more than the everyday mundane drudge of life. My friend Philly and I enjoyed getting together and watching horror movies and telling urban legends. We started doing this almost weekly, especially during the summer when school was out. Of course, this was pre-internet era, so all we had media-wise was actually renting a movie or physically going to the theater. And since most horror movies were R-rated, we couldn't see them. I'm sure to most millennials or post-millennials, this sounds like a nightmare scarier than any real-life story. Because we got tired of renting the same movies over and over, we often focused on urban legends, what we call creepypastas today. We might find some books at the library that had them, or we just made our own up. At this time, we wanted to feel some actual terror. I wish we would have just stuck with our stupid scary stories. I bet every group of friends had one of those Parker Brothers made board games stashed somewhere. The infamous Ouija board. This toy, quote unquote, is simple. They even used to advertise it. A board with the alphabet, numbers, yes, no, and goodbye. I suppose this was inevitable. Every kid has to learn for themselves that these are not to be played with literally and metaphorically. Growing up in a God-fearing family, I knew this felt wrong. I felt this board wasn't right. I also could see through the marketing strategy that Parker Brothers were selling these specifically to children, like all board games. But this was different. They wanted kids to play this only, not adults. You played Monopoly and Shoots and Ladders with your parents, you sure didn't play the Ouija with them. I felt this was wrong, but I also didn't know anything. I was 13. My current 35-year-old self has a hard time understanding what happened and why I dove into this, knowing the outcome would not be ideal. I found it, my buddy Philly said, under my sister's bed. This was the start of a series of events that would haunt me for quite a while. It, of course, was the board. We made sure no one was home when we pulled it out. There was an air of mischief around this thing. Certainly, we couldn't deal with his sister finding us in her room, and definitely not his mom finding out what we were up to. The board was glossy and new. It looked like we were possibly the first to use it. The device that two or more people used to glide over the board, revealing the answers to your questions, was almost ivory. I wanted to research what this was called, 
but I don't even want to start down the rabbit hole online. If you've noticed, I don't even want to call it by its name, simply referring to it as the board. I'll call the gliding thing the oracle for this story. We had two sessions with the board. The first was incident-free. We asked a few silly questions, what our future held, if we would get married and have kids, stuff like that. Even though I had never played this before, I still knew not to ask questions like what was the name of the person that we were talking to. Maybe we had gotten that from the hours of watching scary movies. The second session was when things got weird. Philly and I were going back and forth with the board, asking some simple questions about our future lives. I remember asking where I would live as an adult, and the board said, Seattle. I lived 2,000 miles away from Seattle at the time, but this is where I felt the aura of the board shifted. It felt like a thunderstorm was brewing, one where the sky turned red. The oracle we used to piece out our answers to our dumb questions had moved slowly before. Now it was jerking, almost moving off the board to the next letter. I can tell you this about this game. It is real, and neither one of us were moving the oracle. My hands weren't even on it at some points. But back to the Seattle question. I was, and still am a huge baseball fan. I have rooted, unfortunately, for the Detroit Tigers for my entire life. The mid to late 90s was the explosion of Ken Griffey Jr. to Major League Baseball. I loved watching him play. I got his jerseys for a couple Christmases and birthdays. I am sure most know that Griffey played for the Seattle Mariners. I loved how that nautical S looked on that teal uniform. I started researching the city of Seattle and thought how cool it would be to live there. Do you know where this is going? This board was not plastic and glue to me anymore. There was something controlling it something powerful and dark that knew I had this particular city on my mind at this time. I didn't let on to my buddy what I was feeling. He didn't seem to let on that he was afraid either. So, we kept on. The next segment of questions is a blur to me. All I remember is the oracle going mostly to no when we asked a question, even if it wasn't a yes or no answer that was required. Then I asked the last question that I would ever ask the Ouija. Don't get your hopes up. It was nothing profound or deep at all. This is what I asked. Would the Detroit Tigers ever win another World Series? The Oracle moved so fast to goodbye, I thought a tiny trail of fire would be on the board. I'll never forget looking at Philly and seeing what I'm sure was the exact same bulging eyes, mouth open expression that I had on my face. We knew that one of the rules of this game was when the board said goodbye, you put it away immediately. I think we even read that on the instructions. We threw the board into its box, hustled to his sister's room as fast as two Hostess Cupcake and Mountain Dew filled teenagers could. Philly chucked the board under her bed like nothing happened. After a few breathless moments, we finally started to let out tiny little laughs, lighting up into belly laughs as we hit the floor rolling. We were laughing out the nervousness, also kind of feeling dumb at how scared we got. After the madness finally started dying down, we moved on like nothing happened. I should have stated right from the start that it was late at night when we started playing. I would say it was about midnight, as cliche as that is. When the board said goodbye to us, it couldn't have been more than 1 a.m. in the morning. Philly lived in the country. Across the street was a cemetery. I know, now I'm really hitting cliche territory, but I swear it's true. There weren't many houses around. If you wanted to walk to your next door neighbor, you better plan for a good 20 minute hike. Finally, all mania was shed and tired from playing video games, we decided to step outside. We looked at the graveyard, 
noting how calm the night was. Philly had a large section of his yard covered with rose bushes. They were pretty wild and were not kept up. Needless to say, nothing would be able to get into those bushes and not get completely diced. We heard rustling. Again, the night was calm and I don't remember any wind at all. At first, we could just hear the bushes. Then, movement. To this day, I do not know and don't care to know what it was. It could have been a small animal, but I highly doubt it. We knew something wasn't right and bolted for his house. Even writing this, I can feel an eerie presence. We both knew this was related to the board. Philly suggested we make it a night and try to get some sleep. I wish that was the end of this story. A few short hours later, we were woken up to a series of faint knocking noises. I could not determine what they were coming from, but it sounded like it was somewhere outside his house. We both cautiously got up and moved to the kitchen, where his front door was, and saw something that made my heart drop into my stomach. A man, slight build, wearing all denim, was standing right outside the door. The man also had creepy-looking horn-rimmed glasses on, outdated even for the late 90s. Philly had a porch in the front that was raised about five steps from the ground, and the man was on the ground. So when we saw him, we were actually looking slightly down at him, seeing him from the top of his head down. It is an image that is burned into my mind. He didn't move. He just stood there. We once again fled to his room and shut the door. We didn't call the police or his mom. We just sat in his room, not sure what to do. After a few moments, we stupidly decided to see if he was still there. He was gone. I successfully convinced myself that there was no man on the side of the house. I just couldn't handle what was happening on this night. Philly did the same. Finally, day broke, and we dismissed the disturbing events of the previous night. I don't even think we discussed what happened. About a week later, I got a call from Philly. He said he had a dream that we were playing the board, and a hand came out and attempted to pull his head down. He awoke sweating and in a small amount of pain from where the force had grabbed him. I hated to say that I had a similar dream. Right there, we decided to meet up and do something about this board. My mom dropped me off at his house a few days later to sleep over for the night. When I arrived, I could not find him in his house. This was before cell phones, so I did not have the option to simply call him and see where he was. I checked out back where his garage was. There stood Philly, with the board sitting atop a pile of kindling in a burning barrel. His mischievous grin told me what his plan was. We lit that sucker on fire. Nothing happened. Now, I was really freaking out. We have all heard the stories of people attempting to burn a Ouija with no success. Philly wasn't phased, though. We pulled out a jerry can full of gasoline and doused it. The board lit up and quickly evaporated into nothing. It was over. As far as I can remember, nothing happened after that. We didn't speak of anything we experienced that night. Over the years, I chalked it all up to an overactive teenage imagination. I may have told a handful of people over the years, mainly just to tell a scary story. I know I've said this a few times, but I have completely treated this like it never happened. This, to me, was all imagined. We did play the game, but the rustling bush, the man, none of that happened. Over the years, I moved quite a distance away from Philly. We kept in touch a few times a year, even making the almost 1,000 mile drive to see him about 10 years ago. Fast forward 10 more years, and I decided to make the trip one last time to see my hometown 
and get together with Philly. He invited some people from the area and struck up a massive bonfire. In between bites of pizza and swigs of beer, I recounted the story of that night. I told him how I imagined the aftermath of our decision to use that board. I know you're going to think this is crazy, but I thought there was a man standing outside your house that night. I said. Philly looked at me as stone cold as he could and said, Yeah, I remember that. My blood never went colder. My friend confirmed exactly what happened that night. It was like we were both there again. 22 years ago. I repressed that Ouija board so hard, I made myself believe it never happened. The Ouija is nothing to be played with. I haven't touched or looked at one in over two decades. How a piece of cardboard can summon some kind of evil from another realm is beyond me. I just know you don't want to open it. Back in 2007, when I was 19, I moved to a coastal town in Oregon from Texas. My mom was moving with my younger brother for a job and didn't want to be alone in a new state, so I had decided to move with her. I had moved around a lot by that point in my life already, and I never liked staying in one place for too long. I worked as a pharmacy technician at the time. I switched my license over to Oregon, got a job and rented a studio apartment that was located in the basement of a very large house my landlady had inherited from her parents. She rented out the rooms in the house to boarders. To get to the apartment, you would enter the property from a side gate and follow a walkway down this little slope and around to the back of the house. When you walked through the door, you would end up in the small kitchen that had a window over the sink overlooking the backyard that was enclosed by an eight-foot-tall privacy fence. And that's where I was when the strange things began about a month after I had moved in. I was washing up at the sink, in front of the window, after making something to eat one night at around 11 p.m., when my cell phone rang. Noticing it was an unknown caller, I dried my hands off and answered the phone. I said... Hello? And on the other end of the line was an odd, garbled voice making incomprehensible noises. It almost sounded like someone trying to speak underwater, but also slightly robotic sounding. Thinking maybe it was a bad connection, I said, Hello? Again. This time, the weird garbled voice said something I could make out very clearly. We can see you in the window. Terrified, I hung up the phone, made sure my doors were locked, turned off all the lights, and closed the curtain in the window over the sink. The only window in the basement studio. Then I called my older brother in Texas. We always were, and still are, extremely close, and I told him what happened. After a bit, we decided it was probably some prank caller that got lucky in guessing that I had just been visible in a window. I mean, not very original, right? There hadn't been any sign that someone was in the backyard. There was an extremely high privacy fence, so it was unlikely they had saw me over it. And this was a brand new Oregon number that I had hardly given out to anyone. I felt a bit better after that but still, didn't sleep very well that night. In the weeks after that call, I settled in more and was feeling more comfortable in my new surroundings. I got closer to some co-workers at my new job at a local pharmacy and made some casual friends. I hadn't gotten any more calls in that time and didn't feel as alone in the town anymore, especially with one of my new friends I met at work, living just three streets away. But my feeling of comfort and settling in wouldn't last very long. The unknown caller called again. And again. It got to the point of where it happened on a near nightly basis. 
Most of the time, it was that same garbled underwater voice just babbling nonsense. But sometimes it would say things I could make out, though almost equally incomprehensible. You think you are better than us because we do drugs? Set it on fire. We are your masters. I was creeped out, but still kept telling myself I was the victim of a random dialer that got their jollies off saying weird stuff to 19-year-old girls, so I carried on with my life. This had gone on for a couple of months when one night, I had gone across the street from my apartment, in front of an old abandoned church, to call my brother in Texas to shoot the breeze. It was late, about 2 a.m., and sound carried up into the house above my apartment. I would frequently have bouts of insomnia, and my brother was usually up, so I would often sit on the steps of the church and smoke when I made late-night phone calls to not disturb anyone in the house. I had been talking to my brother for about 20 minutes when another call beeped in. I checked, and it was an unknown number. So, I told my brother to hang on, and I answered. It was the distorted voice again, telling me they are watching me in front of the church and asked, Who are you talking to? Panicked, I looked all around me. I couldn't see anything. I switched back to my brother and told him what was happening as I ran towards my apartment. I got inside and locked the door. I stayed on the line with my brother while I searched my apartment, making sure I was alone. I thought about calling the police, and my brother thought I should too. But what could they do? I talked myself into it just being some weird game someone was playing on me, and that I had nothing to worry about. A few weeks went by without any calls, and after a bit, I was sure they had gotten bored with the whole thing. I had been more cautious after the last call, but as time went on without any more calls, I began to feel more confident that it really all was just some harmless, albeit cruel, joke someone was playing on me. So, one night, pretty late, I decided to walk a few blocks up the hill from my house to a 24-hour store to buy some snacks. On my way back from the store, I started to feel the late hour, and I stopped and sat on a bench near the library to take a bit of a rest and sip on one of the drinks I had just bought. Behind me was a street that ran along the side of the library, and my friend's street was just off of it, directly behind the bench. Within moments, a big man appeared. He was in his late 30s or early 40s, wearing heavy work boots, jeans, and a thick Carhartt work jacket, and a black ball cap. He sat next to me on the bench, a bit too close for comfort. I was nervous because it was the extremely early hours of the morning. Someone else just happening to innocently be there didn't seem all that likely to me. At the time, though, I was young. I didn't really know what to do. I was there too, wasn't I? And I wasn't up to anything. I wasn't sure if my discomfort was really all that valid. I didn't want to seem rude because in my mind, in all likelihood, he wasn't a dangerous person. So I sat there until he said, Hi. I said hi back and scooted away from him as inconspicuously as I could. We sat in silence for a moment and feeling like I could and should leave without it being too weird or rude, I was about to get up when he said, Would you like to be my friend? He had a light accent I couldn't really place. Nonplussed, I said, Excuse me? And he said, We could be friends. We could go in the bushes. And he gestured towards this trail that ran behind the library that leads to a park on the other side of the building. It was enclosed on both sides by bushes that ran the whole length. At this point, I was getting really nervous and was trying to decide if I should just run for it and which direction I should go. My friend's street ran behind me, 
but his house was at the very end of the street, and it was all uphill. I have never been very athletic, so I couldn't decide if that was easier, or my apartment, which was downhill. I could go faster, but I didn't want him to know where I lived if he followed me. What he said next made me realize it was a pointless concern. He already knew where I lived. I missed you. I haven't seen you since the church. This is the guy that had been calling me. As quickly as the realization came to me, I sprung up, dropping my shopping bag. I turned and ran towards my friend's street as fast as I could in flip-flops, with the guy right behind me. Even with the blood pumping in my ears, brought on by my flight and pure terror, I could hear him chasing after me, his heavy work boots hitting the ground. It didn't take long before I felt him try to grab me. In the chase, though, it ended up being more like a shove, right on my left shoulder, and suddenly, my feet were tangled up in my flimsy flip-flops, and I was falling forward into the road. I let out an involuntary, blood-curdling scream, which seemed to have scared him, because the next thing I know, I hear his boots running back down the hill and off down the main street. I got up as quickly as I could and ran full force to my friend's house and pounded on his door. I could tell he was startled. It was the middle of the night. I was out of breath, shaking and crying. And later I would notice... Bloody. I had hit my forehead on the cement when I fell, and it was badly cut. My joggers were ripped. My knees were skinned and bloody. I was so worked up I couldn't get a word out to explain to him why I had shown up on his doorstep at that hour and in the state that I was in. He called the police, and after calming down enough, I told them and my friend what had happened. The phone calls. Everything. They drove around to see if they could find the man that fit my description. They never did, and nothing ever came from it. I moved out of my apartment in the following days and stayed with my mom until I eventually moved out of the state a few weeks later. I just couldn't handle being anywhere near where all this happened. I don't think I could have ever felt safe there again. To this day, I have no idea who that man was, let alone how he got my new phone number that I had hardly given out to anyone. One suspicion I always had was that maybe he knew someone I worked with. Our phone numbers were listed on a paper and tacked to the bulletin board in the office. When this theory came to me, I realized the unknown caller always said, We. Was it him and one of the other people I worked with? Is that why he said we when he called me? At one point, I even suspected the friend I had ran to that night of being in on it. Was it just a coincidence that the man approached me so close to his house? I was a mess afterward and had all kinds of suspicions. Either way, I didn't see the man in town again before I left, and I never received another call from him. Just to preface, my memory is a little hazy, whether it be from time or from what happened. And for my privacy, let's say my name is Max. I grew up in a medium-sized city in Wisconsin. This story takes place during elementary school. I think it was the third grade. The day started off like any other. I was going through classes, taking notes, and participating every now and again. It was a few hours into the school day when I raised my hand to ask if I may use the restroom. The teacher gave me the go-ahead and told me not to take too long. I exited the class and started walking to the boys' room, specifically the one closer to a set of doors leading to the playground. I knew not many kids use that one unless it's recess, so it should be clear at the moment. 
I was pretty shy when it came to going to the bathroom with other people in with me. I usually would end up holding it in and just waiting for everyone else to clear out. Luckily, I picked a good time. The bathroom was empty, and so were the stalls. So I went ahead and went about my business. Just as I finish up, I hear the door open. What great timing, I thought to myself. So I clean up, flush, and make my way to the sink to wash up. But I turned to look and see whom had come into the bathroom. I was immediately confused. There was a boy, too old to be a kid, but not old enough to be a teacher. So I shyly said hello to the tall young man. I can't remember his face well, but I do remember he had dirty blonde hair and blue clouded eyes. He was also really thin, but muscular, and he looked like an older teenager. The stranger simply said, Hey, a kid, how's it going? In a chipper tone of voice to which I said, Good, I'm just about done if you need to go. He shook his head no and looked me up and down. I didn't really pay it any mind and started to get paper towels to dry my hands. All of a sudden, he asked me, Hey, do you like wrestling? Which really puzzled me. What a weird topic. And why now? I don't even know you. Those were the first thoughts that came to mind. Not really, but I haven't seen much, was the only answer I could come up with. He followed up by saying, Oh, okay, cool, cool. Well, hey, I love wrestling. Seeing those guys on stage, it's so awesome. Oh, hey, can I show you this cool new move that I saw them use last night? I started getting pretty anxious and sweaty. I didn't really want to stay in the bathroom for him to show me his moves, so I told him I would have to pass and that I didn't want to be late for class. To which he said, Oh, don't worry. It won't be long. Here, let me show you. He started walking up to me, and it was only then that I realized just how much taller he was. My heart started going a mile a minute, and the next thing I knew, he put his hands around my throat. He started smiling this giant ear-to-ear -ear grin. His breath smelled like cigarettes. I tapped his arm and asked for him to please let me go, with desperation in my voice. He just smiled bigger and began to chuckle to himself as he began lifting me up against the wall, pinning me to it with one hand, still holding me by the throat with the other. I felt my throat tighten and my windpipe close off. My eyes began to water. I was using my hands to cling to his arm desperately trying to break free as I struggled. And then, like a jolt of lightning, the idea came to me. With all my strength and might, I kicked him as hard as I could right in the balls. I felt his grip loosen for just a second, and then tighten with two times more force. It didn't work. He laughed and said, Good effort! This time sounding a lot meaner. I started getting cold as my sight began to blur, and my consciousness was slipping. I blacked out. The world and noise faded away and after that I woke up on the bathroom floor. He was gone. So I got up, a bit shaky, still trying to figure out where he was, and I left the boys' room and slowly walked down the hall back to class, peering over my shoulder to check if he was behind me. I got to my class and stood in the frame of my classroom door, looking down at my shoes and the white tile, only to hear my teacher. Max, didn't I tell you to hurry? It's been 30 minutes. What were you doing in there? I was stunned. I was alone in that bathroom, knocked out with a stranger, for 30 minutes. I yelled back at my teacher in a raspy, harsh voice. Well, it's not my fault some guy choked me. She gave me a mean but curious look and told me to go to my seat and sit down, as if she didn't understand me so I trudged back to my desk and sat. I never told my school what happened, 
and I told my mom almost 10 years after. The guy never got punished. I don't even think anyone knew he did something. If you want a lesson from this, school bathrooms suck. It was the summer of 2012 and a dry, hot California day. I was 12 years old and lived in the mountain areas of California with my parents. I didn't have a cell phone yet, so I spent most of my days outside playing in the dirt. This day in particular was the worst. My parents were in a toxic marriage with each other and spent most of their days fighting. This day, the fight was so bad that my dad left and my mom went straight to sleep in an alcohol-induced coma. I was old enough to understand not to get involved and just stay outside. So I did. I was playing in the backyard when I started to hear a woman's cry. At first, I thought it might just be my mother waking up and getting upset again. Her bedroom window was always open and faced the backyard. So in my mind, this felt completely logical I went back to what I was doing, and about two minutes later, I heard the cry again, and this time it had grown louder. I began to feel unsettled as I realized that the sound was coming from in front of me, not behind me. I peeked around the corner and looked down the street to be faced with a horrific image. There was a grown woman walking down the street. She was completely naked and covered in blood. She was crying with the most unsettling cry I had ever heard. I thought to myself, I need to get inside. But because I hesitated, it gave the woman time to notice me, and she began speed walking up to my house. I was frozen with fear as this woman approached me. She was crying and breathing heavily. As she got closer, I realized the blood was actively pouring from her stomach. I ran up my stairs and started screaming for my mom. The woman shouted, Wait! I don't want to hurt you. Please, I need help. Tears were welling up in my eyes, and I was shaking from fear. I stopped in my tracks at the top of the stairs and said, Okay, sit on the stairs and I'm going to go get my mom. The woman responded, Thank you so much. I have been attacked and he's still looking for me. Being a dumb 12-year-old, this was somewhat comforting to me to know that she was a normal woman who had been hurt, but concerning that she may bring an attacker to my house. I went and woke up my mom, who was angry at me for waking her up and telling a lie. She came outside with me anyways, and I watched her face lose color, and she realized there really was a bloody woman on the porch. My mom yelled at me to go grab the woman one of her old t-shirts and to call 911. I brought my mom's t-shirt and she helped the woman get dressed. I called 911 on the house telephone and frantically explained what had happened. The operator asked me, Sweetheart, are you there alone? I responded, No, my mom is here with me, sitting next to the woman. The 911 operator took a deep breath and said, This is what I need you to do. I need you to tell your mom the ambulance is on the way, and then tell her to get inside and lock all of your doors until the police and paramedics arrive. I was confused, and I once again explained to the operator that the woman was attacked, and the attacker is out looking for her. The operator then said something that sent chills down my spine. Sweetheart, she is the attacker. She stabbed her neighbor 37 times. He called first and was picked up about 30 minutes ago. Police have been looking for this woman for months, as this is not the first time she has attacked someone. It was at that moment that I looked outside and noticed that the woman was holding a box cutter in her left hand. I screamed at my mom to get inside now, 
which caused the woman to jump up and pull the box cutter towards my mom. My mother kicked her and ran inside. The woman banged and kicked at our door for the entire 15 minutes it took the police and ambulance to arrive. When they got there, she stopped and began to cry again. She attempted to tell the police that she had been attacked, but they obviously were not buying it. They put the woman in the ambulance, and the police handcuffed her to the railing of her bed. The sheriff called later that night and explained that the woman's stab wound on her stomach was done by her to make it look like she had truly been attacked. He had also said that this man, the neighbor, was the third victim of hers in the past few months, and that if we had waited any longer, we could have been next. I was given a stern talking to by the sheriff about how dangerous this could have gone, and how I should never talk to strangers. It was hard to focus on him though, because all I could hear in my head was the 911 operator saying, Sweetheart, she is the attacker. Just for context, I am a 23 year old male who lives in the Midwest surrounded by woods and open farmland. I often have sleep paralysis, and I don't have creepy or off-putting experiences. Sometimes I will hear something, or see something that I think could be just my brain still half asleep. Not too scary. For anyone who hasn't had sleep paralysis before, it's mostly just being awake, and not being able to move. And yes, that sounds scary, but to a person that it happens to almost on a weekly basis, you get kind of used to it. Most of the time I just realize I'm in that state of being awake and not being able to move, so I usually just casually try to move my leg and arm muscles to eventually wake up and reposition myself so I can try to go back to sleep. Usually changing positions helps. There were two occasions that I would like to share that genuinely terrified me. The first incident was the very first time I had sleep paralysis. I was about eight years old, and I was living with my grandparents at the time, in the middle of a 26-acre plot on the countryside. I had a television set that was from the 80s or 90s. Basically, one of those types of TVs that gave you that weird static feeling if you got too close. Anyway, I was sleeping one night, and I heard the sound of metal scraping, and I woke up. The TV had a white static that was illuminating my room. In the room, there was a closet that had a broken sliding door that would only open with extreme force. Enough force that I, as an eight-year-old child, couldn't even open. Well, the scraping metal sound was the door sliding open, and I knew it was that sound because I had heard it all the time when my grandparents needed to get into that closet. When I realized what it was, I thought it was one of my grandparents, though I thought it was strange that they were trying to get into the closet, since it was around 2 or 3 a.m. at the time, and there isn't really anything they should need in there at that time of night. It was mostly just old clothes and random knickknacks they have collected. When I went to turn my head to see what it was, I couldn't move my head, so I tried to pull my blanket off my body to try and stand up and I couldn't. The only feeling I had was what I could best describe as that feeling when your arm or leg falls asleep and you get that pins and needles feeling. Yeah, that, but across my entire body. I was genuinely terrified of why I couldn't move and why I heard the closet opening. Eventually, I turned my eyes enough to see out of my peripheral vision a figure standing halfway out of the closet staring at me. Not moving, just standing, staring. It was watching me struggle to move, and I couldn't do anything but stare back. I will never forget the long, gangly look of the figure. If I had to compare it to something, I would say it reminds me of the rake. But obviously this was a time before internet scary stories and creepypastas, so I didn't know what that was at the time. 
All I know is, I was in a complete state of shock and horror, and I tried to let out a scream to alert my grandparents, but I couldn't even muster up a squeak. Eventually, with enough brute force and a will to live, I managed to regain all my senses and shot up out of my bed and ran to turn on the light. The figure was gone, but the closet was still open. I remember running to my grandparents' room and screaming that there was a man in my closet, and my grandpa, who was a hunter, had many weapons in the house and grabbed one. He threatened anyone who was in the house that they better show themselves. No one was there. I told them about the closet, but they just told me it must have been open already. I know it wasn't open, because that closet already scared me, and I made sure it was closed before I went to bed. I never slept in that room again. I had my brother switch me rooms. I made up an excuse that I didn't like the color of the room, and he just went along with it. But I think he knew I was scared, and he was older, so he took the room just to be a good brother. I never told him of the experience I had with the figure, because I didn't even know if it was real or not. The second experience was more recent, and the only other time that I have had a truly terrifying experience with sleep paralysis. I am now married, and I told my wife about my sleep paralysis, but I told her not to worry too much, because I am more used to it happening, and I usually just keep my eyes shut to avoid seeing anything creepy. And like I said before, it's easily manageable, and I usually don't see anything anyway. I just want to be sure. Anyway, this experience happened a few days before writing this. It was during the middle of the day, and I was taking a nap in my bed. Usually, when I have sleep paralysis, I can get myself out of it within a few seconds and go back to bed like nothing really happens. Not this time. This time, I woke up and knew I was paralyzed so I tried to move my arms and legs around to get my body awake, but for some reason, I could not get myself out of it. Like I said, I keep my eyes closed to avoid seeing anything. But this time, after about two or three minutes of trying to wake myself up, I started to get frustrated, so I decided to open my eyes. To my left is a large window, I live in an apartment complex in the underground level, so the window leads straight to the ground at eye level. Well, outside in broad daylight, I saw what looked to be the same figure I saw as a child. I can't be too sure though. All I know is that this thing was tall and black and it was walking toward my window. Outside the apartment complex is a line of trees about 40 feet back and it was at the tree line, as it slowly got closer. I noticed some features on the figure. Its eyes were beet red, and it was smiling wide. Its teeth were poking out of its mouth, and they were razor sharp. I couldn't do anything but watch in terror as this tall, horrifying figure walked toward me. It put me in a state of fear, and I honestly almost started to cry thinking my life was about to end. Finally, after about 30 seconds of me staring at this figure getting closer to me, I finally managed to wake myself up, and just as soon as it appeared, it was gone. I will never forget the way it was staring at me, menacingly, almost like it was enjoying watching me suffer.